Welcome, everyone. We will be recording today's session as you as you just heard. And if you will, um, if you have any technical difficulties during today's meeting, please do contact um, either of the or both of the people in uh, on the top right on this slide, Katrina Perone or Wendy Venasco, and they will assist you with any difficulties. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide. All right, just a little bit of housekeeping for, for today's meeting. Again, the, the people to contact Katrina Perone and Wendy Benasco. Uh, during the meeting, audience lines, you, you will be muted. Um, you may use the chat feature for comments during the event. It's found at the bottom of the screen. You can, there's a screen grab here on this slide with a, the chat portion highlighted. And we will utilize that for um, asking questions during the panel discussions and, and do have moderators capturing those, those questions as they, as they arrive. And we will be recording um, today's event. Uh, additionally, when we get to the, to the session, um, we will have breakout rooms today that everyone has been pre-assigned to. Um, and, and you have a, a similar, the same topic in each room, in a, but in order to facilitate um, better discussion, we've uh, split it out into smaller, slightly smaller groups. And, and look forward to your, your dialogue there. Um, the, the, the lines will all be unmuted and you can either speak or use the chat feature during that facilitated uh, breakout session today. So we look forward to that for, for your participation there and throughout the day. All right, let's, let's go to the next slide. So um, I'd, I'd like to welcome, oh, let's see, yeah, right here, thank you. Welcome everyone once again, um, we have been working on this for quite some time, and I'm very excited that we've made it to the, the events today. And, um, and so we, and I would like to welcome you in, in joining us and participating in today's International Drug-Induced Kidney Injury Biomarker Workshop. And uh, we are hosting this over two days, um, today the 23rd and tomorrow the 24th. We, um, we have been planning this for some time, and I'd like to thank um, the organizers and the planning committee, as well as the topic specific teams who have all made this possible. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I, I would like to take a moment and thank the CPATH staff who have been working behind the scenes with, uh, with many of you throughout the whole process. In particular, Michelle Morgan, Wendy Benasco, Tina Fortin, Kat Katrina Perone, Laura Hopkins, and Laura Lummis. Without their, um, their time and dedication to this, um, we, we wouldn't have been able to, to move forward and, and have today's workshop. So thank you very much. So let's, let's go into the next slide. And so as I mentioned, we, we had a, a very broad group of stakeholders we invited to participate and, and work in planning and organizing this workshop with people from the FDA, NIDDK, we looked to the patient community, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, staff at CPAP, the Critical Path Institute, as well as the American Society of Nephrology, and we brought in um, scientists from academia and, and uh, working physicians. And our, our goal here being that we would capture as many people across the, the, the space working in um, kidney disease and kidney injury to address the, the best path forward in, in advancing um, uh, biomarkers to detect and monitor drug-induced kidney injury. And, and I, I keep it there at that, at that very narrow area um, because we, we decided uh, a little bit early on to, to narrow our focus overall so that we weren't trying to, say, boil the ocean, but address one, one item at a time. And I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit more in, in a slide or so. Go to the next slide. And so throughout this, we, we formed um, individual sub-teams to address overall topics and ensure we captured um, input from everyone participating. So we had a patient engagement team, an industry and landscape team, as well as a connectivity, um, or excuse me, an industry team, and then a landscape and connectivity sub-team who, who all contributed their time and talent and expertise in, in preparation for this workshop. And all these individuals here um, devoted quite a bit of time to, to making this workshop possible. So thank you. And the next slide. And so, you know, what was our, our impetus here? It, it was really to bring together stakeholders across, uh, you know, people who have experienced 
um, or, or are experiencing kidney disease or acute kidney injury, um, drug-induced kidney injury, and, and how it's impacted their lives and their families, and what they, what they would like to see um, better communicated with them in the future or, or better ways to, to monitor and detect this before it becomes um, uh, a, a, a serious risk to them. Um, as well, the, the pharmaceutical and biotechnology um, it, scientists and, and their, their research that they have going on, as well as academic scientists, the clinicians working with patients on a daily basis, as well as the, the health authorities who are reviewing and approving um, new therapies uh, throughout the year. As well, um, since we are talking about biomarkers and, and measurement, the, the contact research organizations and, um, and, and assay developers working to make these, these biomarkers readily available and, and deployable and, and being able to implement them in, um, in practice of uh, drug development as well as in clinical practice in the long run. And so, um, you know, this is a scientific discussion, not a formal binding meeting, but we're hoping to put forth a, 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 a framework for an action plan and, and the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are, are those of the speakers and panelists today. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we would like to thank the, the FDA for um, uh, partial funding of this. We, the, the Critical Path Institute receives um, support via a grant from the FDA um, right now, and uh, we, we do appreciate that support. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so what, what are we here today to discuss? Well, there, there, you know, there are challenges right now in terms of assessing kidney disease and kidney injury. And, and one, one aspect of this is looking at um, ways to monitor kidney function and kidney health using um, biomarkers. And, and what, we're, what we're looking at here you know, is a kind of a spectrum of application of these biomarkers from um, utilizing uh, biomarkers that are specific and sensitive to the kidney to detect drug-induced kidney injury um, regardless of the drug indication, um, using drug development and drugs to treat acute kidney injury and ways to monitor efficacy in, 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 new, in new trials um, that are developing drugs, as well as in the, the diagnosis and clinical care of acute kidney injury to, to monitor its, its progress and, um, and uh, return to normal for a person or uh, and, and then as well, looking um, a little bit farther on in, in terms of um, chronic kidney disease and, and diagnosis and clinical care kind of covers the overall spectrum of, of some of the applications um, for utilizing kidney specific biomarkers. Uh, today, we're going to focus and tomorrow primarily on drug induced kidney injury biomarkers, um, though they do have overlapping application across these, these other three areas I've mentioned. And so in order to do that, I kind of want to do a little bit of a level set before we move into today's discussion um, for some of the routes that a, a biomarker or a drug development tool um, is accepted by, reg, by uh, regulatory agencies for, for use and application in um, drug development. So we go to the next slide. In, uh, at the FDA and, and in many places, there are three different manners that um, biomarkers may be utilized with, within drug development. The first is um, on an individual basis when you are submitting an IND or, or an NDA, you may request and provide supporting evidence to use a, a biomarker for a specific purpose within that, um, that, that drug uh, approval application. Um, that is a, a one-off um, use case and, and isn't broadly available or known necessarily to, to everyone in the community. The second is the scientific is, is through scientific community consensus. And that usually takes quite a, quite a few years and, um, and a broad set of input towards um, coming to a conclusion that, that something is that a biomarker is specific and sensitive for its specific use. And then the third, is looking at um, what, what the FDA has as their drug development tool qualification programs or DDT qualification program. That's a specific process 
for um, advancing uh, new biomarkers for acceptance within a specific context of use in drug development. And so go to the next slide. So I, I, I kind of covered what, what, what each of these are uh, before, but again, to, to, to reiterate, the, you know, the, in drug programs, you know, based upon agreement with the, with the uh, division within the FDA and the EMA, um, the context and, the, and in the context of a specific drug development program, a, a biomarker may be utilized with agreement on, on both sides from the, the submitter and the reviewer. And then scientific community consensus is, is looking at broadly or widely used drug development tools and a, with appropriate scientific support and that it is generally accepted by ex experts in the field. And then the, the, the third is that the formal process with the FDA um, the, the European equivalent EMA and the Japanese equivalent of EMDA have similar processes to review and accept uh, new biomarkers based on appropriate submission of a qualification package and that it, it, you have an approved context of use for, for the specific types of trials and injury that you're, you're going to be measuring in the case of a safety biomarker or something to detect drug induced kidney injury. And so with those as kind of a baseline for, for today's meeting, I, I, I'd like to move on to the next slide and we'll, we'll look at what we have for, for today's meeting. Um, we, we're, we're beginning today looking at um, overall the landscape and beginning to, to narrow it down as we move through. And so we um, will be beginning each session with, um, with various stakeholder perspectives. Specifically, we'll have um, personal sp perspectives from individuals who have uh, who have had a kidney disease or, or acute kidney injury, uh, as well as experts in the field providing their appropriate stakeholder perspective. And let's go to the next slide. And then um, in session two, we begin to, to look at how we're going to address the unmet needs. Um, this is where we will have the breakout session and, and split out. We have facilitators for, for each one of the breakout sessions with a set of questions um, that, that we put forth at the beginning and, and welcome additional questions to brainstorm today on, on moving forward with an action plan. Let's go to the, the next slide. So on the third day, we're gonna focus a little bit more on, on building solutions and, and innovation in, in, uh, in innovating on, on drug development tools. And, and here we're looking at where there's been success through collaboration well, we do have one more breakout session. We're going to uh, begin to refine and put together um, the, the framework for an action plan. And then, and, and, and then we're also going to look at some of the ways that, that data sharing um, it is going to be imperative to uh, success in the future because um, it, it does require a, a large amount of data to move forward and make this a successful venture. And, and what we would like to see is broader acceptance of, of some of these novel um, kidney injury biomarkers that have been identified. They have received um, uh, some levels of, of regulatory acceptance today. Um, I won't go into detail. We have some of the speakers addressing uh, how they've been accepted for regulatory use in presentations later on today. And so with that, I welcome everyone um, to um, uh, enjoy these uh, these these uh, presentations that are that are coming up, and we will um, welcome your your comments and questions um, throughout the day, and and specifically during the panel discussions and the, the breakout sessions. And so, at this point, we're going to begin with two um, pre-recorded videos on a personal perspective. So, if you'll go to the, the first video. Bring that up now. My name is Becca Chung, and my relationship to kidney disease is that I have Alport syndrome. I was diagnosed about six years ago, and I've had a transplant successfully for six years. 
I personally experienced drug-induced kidney injury to a small degree post-transplant. It was during that time that I discovered the word nephrotoxic, as many of the drugs that I had to take after my transplant were nephrotoxic, so they actually can hurt your kidneys at a high dosage amount. That's uh, it, it took some time for me to find the right dosage in working with my transplant team. Obviously, I'm fine now, and we hit the right levels. But after my transplant, there were a number of times where I ended up back in the hospital because there was too much of uh, nephrotoxic drugs in my system. And so now I realize the more that you know, universities or researchers can collaborate on their findings when it comes to biomarker data, I think it's incredibly important so that patients can be more aware about the impacts of, of drugs on their bodies, uh, life-saving drugs, actually. So I think it's incredibly important that there's collaboration within the community. This workshop is incredibly important to me on a personal level because, well, first of all, I think education is empowering. And so I want to know more. I would love to learn more from the folks that are presenting. I would love to learn more about drug-induced kidney injury. I would like to be empowered in my own journey. I want to know what I can do to prolong my health, my kidney health, um, what I can stay away from, what are biomarkers that I should be aware of. And I think these are things that sometimes when you're in the doctor's office, you don't necessarily think of to ask your nephrologist or your doctor. And so having a workshop like this allows for patients, researchers, and doctors alike, and just our grander community that's attending to learn a bit more uh, from other people that are in the field and to see what's the latest news when it comes to drug-induced kidney injury and, and other biomarker data that might be available to us. I would love this community and, and researchers to know that I don't know if this is if these are empty words, but it's incredibly important what you're doing. You know, in grad school, I was doing some research on you know some some other things, and the results weren't what I wanted, and it didn't seem like I was doing a lot of impact. But sometimes when I take a step back, and I'm hoping you realize this too, if you take a step back and you realize the impact you have, it's really incredible to see the lives that you're actually changing, even if you're not in an actual doctor's office per se, and you're doing research or you're a, you know, you're a professor, you are changing lives by uh, coming together and collaborating and sharing what you've found. So people like me, just on the patient level, are, are deeply impacted by um, you doing what you do. So I suppose I want you to know that we're grateful. We, as in patients, me, myself, I know my family, my friends, my community, we're grateful for all that you do in terms of research and empowering patients like me to be a little more aware and educated about what we're going through and what we will go through. One more here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Becky. There was one more from, from Marla Levy. Hi, my name is Marla Levy, and I currently have chronic kidney disease stage four. How it all happened was I was perfectly healthy, 41 years old, and during a heart surgery, I they uh, discovered arterial sclerosis and they realized I had to have a second surgery about a week later. I had just had an angiogram a few days beforehand and they had to do a second angiogram. So I had two angiograms within two weeks and nobody discussed anything with me about drug-induced kidney injury. I knew that there were risks, but I didn't know if there were options. Either way, I went into the second heart surgery and unfortunately my heart did not start. So they had to put me on a life support machine. Within 24 hours of being on the life support machine that ran my heart and lungs, my kidneys completely failed. So now I'm in triple organ failure. I have two collapsed lungs. I'm internally hemorrhaging with an infection that was so serious. I was in critical condition. And the first thing they did is put me on continuous renal replacement therapy for 24 hours a day, just to get my kidneys up and running. I was on that for quite some time. 
and I was also still on the life support machine. I was so lucky that after six days, they were able to get my heart to start again on its own. And that gave them something to work with, some hope that I would live. And from that point forward, I started my recovery. Unfortunately, my kidneys were not coming back or how they said waking up. After 90 days, I was not able my kidneys did not wake up and so i they took me from being in end stage renal disease i was in that stage for a few like a year or two I was stage five and then they upgraded me fortunately to chronic kidney disease stage four i feel very fortunate that i was able to survive and have my kidneys turn on just enough to work and through all of this i promised myself if i survive and if i have the strength i will dedicate my life to helping other patients who did not survive situations like i was in and i will be their voice and i will be their advocate i think it's important that patients industry and academia and all stakeholders should be present at this workshop because we need everybody's input, thoughts, wisdom, and experience to come together as a community and address the silent killer of drug-induced kidney injury. What I hope the drug-induced kidney injury community knows is that they have patience behind them, cheering them on, rooting, praying, and doing everything to give us peace of mind that there is going to be either a way to prevent drug-induced kidney injury or treat it in the future. We are your cheerleaders. We are your number one fans, and we applaud you for caring enough about patients like myself to look into something that there's not a lot of information in and make such a significant difference. All right. thank, thank you very much to Becca and Marla for sharing your, your perspective. It is very much appreciated. And so now continuing on with some of the, the stakeholder perspectives, I would like to introduce our, our next speaker. And uh, this is Dr. Eliza Thompson, who is a deputy director of the Division of Cardiology and Nephrology within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the, the US Food and Drug Administration. So Eliza, I'm going to pass it over to you right now. Great, thanks so much, Nick. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So just to start off, I want to start by thanking Becca and Marla for sharing their personal stories. Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues from CPATH for all their work uh, putting together uh, today's workshop and, and tomorrow's workshop. Um, as Nick noted, my name is Elisa Thompson and I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Cardiology and Nephrology in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA. And like Nick, I'm very excited to be here today uh, to discuss what I think is a very important topic, uh, advancing the development of tools to detect uh, and monitor for drug-induced kidney injury. Before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, make a few comments uh, about the history, or at least the, my version of the history uh, that, that led up to this workshop, and also some general observations about data sharing. Over 20 years ago, FDA embarked on an initiative that was intended to transform the way FDA regulated medical products are developed. The report that launched the Critical Path Initiative called for collective action to modernize medical product development. And this included collective action to develop better tools for predicting, assessing, and demonstrating the safety and efficacy of medical products. Over the years, I think there have been many 
successful data sharing efforts aimed at developing tools to facilitate and de-risk medical product development for specific diseases. And while there are also examples of successful data sharing efforts in the safety biomarker space, as, I, as far as I can tell, there are fewer such examples. I think that on the one hand, there is widespread recognition of societal value of successful data sharing efforts in the safety biomarker space. But on the other hand, there are no immediate gains to the individual pharmaceutical companies who contribute such data. And so perhaps for this reason, as well as for other reasons that you'll hear about today, it has been more challenging to convince pharmaceutical companies to share safety biomarker data. So why are we here today? Or rather, why am I here? The Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where I work, has many important responsibilities. And one of the most important responsibilities is to ensure the safety of people who participate in clinical trials. As you'll hear today, Unfortunately, the methods that we currently use to assess for drug-induced kidney injury are neither sensitive nor specific, and so we cannot detect injury to the kidney at an early stage. We need better tools for detecting injury to the kidney. We need better tools to ensure the safety of people who participate in our clinical trials. <clears throat> We also need these tools to ensure that we don't abandon new drugs or evaluate suboptimal doses of a new drug because of false concerns about kidney injury or the inability to determine whether drug-induced changes in kidney function reflect true injury to the kidney. So why is data sharing important? Data sharing is important because there is no single study or source of information that tells us whether a biomarker, something we measure in the blood or urine perhaps, performs well in detecting kidney injury. Understand whether biomarkers are good indicators of drug-induced kidney injury. We will need to integrate data from many different sources and studies. That's why data sharing is critical. We won't make progress unless we share data. So going back to the question, why are we here today? We are here today because as Nick noted, we need better tools to detect drug-induced kidney injury. Fortunately, over the years, important efforts have been undertaken to advance the development of biomarkers of drug-induced kidney injury. As a result, we are beginning to see these biomarkers incorporated into drug development programs to help inform decision-making. But we need to do more. We need to go farther and we need to get there faster. And to do that, we will need to work together and we will need to share data. Over the past year or so, we have been incredibly fortunate to have leaders in the patient community, scientific experts, and representatives from the NIH, CPAS, FDA and pharmaceutical companies join together to organize this workshop. During today's meeting, you will hear from some, but not all, of these individuals. We have, I believe, assembled an impressive team. I want to highlight in particular our partners from industry uh, who have played such an active role thus far in advancing the development of biomarkers of drug-induced kidney injury. And moving forward, I very much hope that more of you in pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies will join us in this very important effort. In closing, I want to acknowledge our patient partners. In the years leading up to this workshop, I don't think we adequately incorporated the patient voice in discussions of this important issue. Thank you for helping us begin to do so. And with that, I think we have Frank next. Yes, thank you very much, Elisa. So I'd like to welcome Frank, uh, Dr. Frank Peterly, who has more than 20 years of industry experience in the areas of biomarkers, in vitro diagnostics, personalized medicine, as well as drug development. 
And so, Frank, I'll, I'll pass it over to you right now. Um, let us know when to advance the slides. Thank you. And thank you very much, first of all, for Becca and Marley for sharing their experiences and coming back to those exactly. Um, Nick, can you present the slides, please? So thank you. Uh, um, so I'm talking as Frank Dietle, Dietle Life Science Consulting. I've been part of several big farmers. I've been advising several biotechs and farmers for drug induced kidney injury. So, but overall, that's my opinion I will express today and it has nothing to do with any farmer I've been associated. So let's go for the next slide. So basically, a drug development is always a, a ratio between benefits and risks. We are not talking about benefits today about specific drugs. Let's talk about the risks and drug induced kidney injury is one of the risks. And we need to think about how can we as a pharma company develop tools to monitor and manage drug induced kidney injury. Next slide, please. So basically, drug-induced kidney injury in drug development is not uncommon. There are even cases where you have entire classes of drugs which are nephrotoxic. Uh, like we heard from Becca before, it's immunosuppressant. There's no uh, immunosuppressant regimen uh, uh, after uh, transplantation of a kidney or liver which is not nephrotoxic, unfortunately. So chemotherapies, analgesics, radiocontrast agents, just to mention some of those. And the worst thing is that the tools to monitor drug-induced kidney injury, they are 100 years old. It's serum creatinine, it's a gold standard, uh, but it's nicer, uh, a functional, uh, uh, a specific marker for kidney injury. It's a functional marker. What's the consequence of a functional marker? It could happen that you lose two thirds of your kidney function until serum creatinine increases. Uh, it's also not specific. There are cases where you have a pharmacologic interaction and uh, the uh, creatinine increases, but you don't have kidney injury. So it's neither sensitive nor specific. And I know uh, Joe Bonventre and others will talk a lot more about this, just to give you a high level uh, flavor of what we are challenged in drug development. Next slide, please. So I'm talking now uh, about two real world examples. I've been advising companies and uh, I take two examples. Uh, the first one is a so-called translational challenge. It was a first in class drug candidate. So a new class, uh, very high up in, in the management view. Uh, but uh, in preclinical studies, we had an issue in red studies. So we did not have an issue in, K, uh, in dog studies, but we, in every animal we treated, we had um, lesions observed in the kidney and we did not have a creatinine increase before. So that's the problem. Can you bring this drug to human? Uh, first discussion is a uh, human more closer to canine or is it more closer to rats? Uh, second discussion, uh, you know you have an issue preclinically. Can you bring this drug into human? Uh, is it safe? How can we manage safety in humans? That's the biggest concern pharma has. So what we would require in this case are tools uh, which allow an early detection of kidney injury and management of kidney injury. So for example, if you new biomarker increases, you stop treating the patient and you know you do not cause harm to him or her. Uh, and these tools should be translational because first of all, you want to prove in animals that you can, can manage kidney safety. It's an early increase of the biomarker in animals. 
you stop treatment and you are not getting advanced lesions and you want to translate that to human. So that's one of the real world examples. Uh, next one, that's the second one example. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the second example. So in this case, uh, we did not have any issues preclinically or first in human, that you only treat a couple of patients. But then in phase two, we suddenly realized that 15% of the patients, so 15% is exactly at the borderline where you're not uh, getting these signals in a phase one study, but in a phase two study, they had an immediate increase of serum creatinine by 25%. 25% is already a lot. When we stopped treatment, it immediately decreased serum creatinine. So we didn't know, is it a real kidney injury or is it a pharmacologic effect in changing the way serum creatinine is processed by the body? So the big question was, how can we prove that? Can we continue this treatment at all? So what we need in this case are tools which detect kidney injury very early and specific. And also in the ideal case, we would know if there is kidney injury, where is it located? Is it a, a top proximal tubular injury? You will learn a lot more about this from our academic colleagues later. So basically, can we locate the injury if there's injury? So next slide. So if we think about an industry, uh, there are many places where kidney biomarkers can help us to bring good new drugs to the patient. It's uh, first of all, if you think about discovery, we would already screen out uh, drugs which are toxic to the kidney. So early identification of non-toxic drugs is a key point. Then if you think about uh, our example number one, which I brought, can we bring drugs to the human if we have doubts if they are really uh, safe to the kidney or not? Then if we go forward in drug development and we have more patients, it's really about manage monitoring and managing kidney safety in human. Could be it's, uh, it's in the safety insert, uh, some comments, but also could be an active test to uh, rule out patients who already are predisposed, uh, basically who have a risk of kidney injury. And then finally, uh, I think that goes beyond the workshop already. We need to think about bringing these tools and biomarkers to everybody's uh, benefit on the market. So it's in so-called in vitro diagnostic tests which can be run in hospitals, labs, GP offices for every patient. So that's the role of biomarkers and drug development. Let's go forward one slide, please. So there we talk all about biomarkers, uh, like always in the life, uh, there are challenges and opportunities. Let's first start with the challenges. Um, if you want to use a biomarker for decision-making, you put a patient at risk. You want to be really sure that you know what the biomarker does. It means uh, limitations, but also what can the biomarker provide you beyond standard of care. So you need a lot of uh, evidence uh, about the limitations and the potential of the biomarker. And uh, as we heard before, you can generate this evidence in clinical studies. But however, if you think of a first of class uh, molecule, um, you may not be able to generate enough evidence within the kin uh, within this specific program. So you need some public, how I call it, or common evidence about the limitations of these biomarkers. What are the opportunities? Well, uh, like CPAS, uh, there are a number of activities, uh, especially driven by CPAS, uh, where we 
try to qualify these kidney biomarkers for preclinical translation and clinical use. We publish this data. Uh, there are several consortia working on these biomarker data. And also, like Alisa already mentioned, the FDA, but also on, in the European space where I'm from, uh, you have the EMA working on biomark qualification programs where you can qualify these biomarkers for general, not drug specific program use. Next slide. However, uh, next slide, thanks. However, it is a little bit disappointing for myself uh, because we have a very slow progress of this official kidney biomarker qualification. 2008, first tests where uh, biomarkers were qualified for preclinical use, 2010, additional biomarkers. 2018, the first biomarkers uh, for phase one studies. But since that time, nothing happened. So what's the problem? The problem is, first of all, consortia, which are looking at this, are running prospective studies. These are expensive and resource intensive. And uh, another issue is the limited willingness of industry to share clinical trial data. So next slide, uh, why do we have this uh, issue? Well, first of all, it's fearing and that's my personal opinion. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this uh, later in, in our panel discussion. Uh, first issue is of course, fearing of sharing sensitive data, which could be used against the drug. What can we do about it? That's my personal opinion. We need to have create a safe harbor framework for sharing of this data. That the company is not hold responsible for the drug specific issues. We need to, uh, second is fearing of sharing samples, which could be used uh, for other purposes, like analyzing the metabolites and trying to find out what the drug is. So basically, again, uh, if industry wants to share data, we need a contractual framework, exactly defining how these samples could be used. There are a lot of legal limitations, uh, data privacy, informed consent, patient rights. I think that one can be solved uh, if we create some kind of uh, frameworks and industry support with uh, templates and supporting industry to run trials in the future that they can share the data. And finally, last but not, at, uh, not least, um, if you share data about a program which has been stopped about kidney injury, you invest time, resources uh, to share these data, to get them out of the local databases of the industry, annotate them with clinical results and so on. So that's a lot of work and industry has not an in immediate incentive. Uh, that's a typical problem. So we need to think about how can we incentivize industry to share data even after a program has died? Let's go to the next one. So what I also would like to have the participants of this workshop to think about is exploring new approaches for collecting data quicker and less resource intensive than prospective studies. This could be creating evidence from publications. We have so many uh, academic partners who did run studies. So let's try to combine the data. Let's think beyond drug-induced kidney injury, acute kidney injury after surgery, uh, like uh, we heard before, uh, are very valuable. They are not exactly the same, but they could contribute to the knowledge we know and need. Um, we need to think about epidemiology approaches. So many publications are out there, we are not using them. And finally, we need to think about how can we incentivize industry and biotech companies. Uh, for example, companies sharing data with the FDA about uh, kidney injury 
in an IND or NDA. Uh, how can we incentivize them to bring these data to a consortium, uh, to databases and consortium? That's what I would like to have uh, as a discussion in this workshop. And finally, my last slide, uh, also to end on a positive note. Last slide, please. Uh, also, I would like to tell you both drug candidates were brought forward. They were brought forward by the rational and reasonable use of kidney biomarkers. And overall, what I would like to get out of this workshop is that we need to find ways of bringing all our data together, be collaborative and support drug development on the one side, but also very clearly help our patients. Thank you for to listening to me. Thank you very much, Frank. And um, our, our final perspective in the opening today is by Dr. Matthias Kretzler. Um, Dr. Kretzler is the, the Warner Lambert Park Davis Professor of Medicine and Nephrology at the University of Michigan, as well as holding a position as a professor in computational medicine and bioinformatics there. Um, the overarching goal of his research is to define chronic kidney disease in mechanistic terms and, and to use this knowledge for targeted therapeutic interventions, um, util utilizing a variety of approaches and methodologies. I'll pass it over to you right now, uh, Matthias. Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot to all of you to be here. This is really exciting times, and the time is now to make an impact as we have heard this morning already is a significant burden drug-induced kidney injury brings to uh, people. Uh, and uh, the time is now because we have made significant advances on many levels. Uh, from the academic perspective, we are defining kidney injury now as cell at a time uh, at a level and focus which specifically induces acute kidney injury and drug-induced kidney injury using Using tissues from uh, patient volunteers who bring uh, that information at a very rich open science database to us. And you will hear throughout the meeting many progresses and advantages uh, the academic community have pushed forward up to having now uh, kidneys on a chip available for uh, exploration and data mining as effective ex vivo systems. So time is now because uh, we can show that in uh, AKI and DICI, as we have heard, we have a first set of non-invasive biomarkers, which are ready to be deployed and can be integrated with this uh, substantial basic science knowledge frame to see how they operate and interoperate and how they define subgroups of drug-induced kidney injury for us to learn from. The time is now because we have predictive and prognostic biomarkers which are successfully deployed across the kidney injury space and are even bringing a port forward into precision medicine clinical trial as we speak. And this is the fourth reason why I think it's an exciting time to be in a kidney research space because after a long drought, we see a flurry of successful clinical trials coming uh, to patients with kidney disease uh, in the uh, kidney injury space in common and rare diseases. And those will give us additional learning opportunities to learn how kidney cells respond to damage and how they recover. And most importantly, the kidney community is getting serious about open science. And the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, which we will hear at multiple stages throughout the meeting, is one of the paradigm example where data are released immediately for your use, and you means really the entire community of stakeholders to really accelerate and propel progress forward, which is so urgently needed. So thank you for being here. We hope that uh, the next two days will be an inspiration how we can bring uh, the community together and develop tools to bring the most effective drugs safely uh, to patients and protecting the kidneys throughout the process. But we have significant challenges yeah. and step ahead of us. And uh, Dr. Himmelfarb, I think, will be the next one to give us an introduction there. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Kretzler. And, and so now, yes, we will move on to our, our first set of uh, full presentations around drug, understanding drug-induced kidney injury. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Himmelfarb, 
He is the, the director of the Kidney Research Institute at the University of Washington, as well as holding positions as the professor of medicine and an adjunct professor of bioengineering, um, as well as holding the, the Joseph W. Eschbach um, Endowed Chair in Kidney Research at the University of Washington. Welcome, Jonathan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first slide. And I, I really want to thank the organizers. I agree, this is a really timely uh, meeting to have. And I thought I would sort of start off with a uh, ground this in a real world clinical case that'll illustrate both the consequences for uh, patients who experience drug induced kidney injury and also some of the challenges and conundrums uh, that we'll have to deal with in this meeting. Next slide. So this is a real world case report of a 50 plus year old man who's had leg pain and weakness for five years. He 25 years previously uh, was diagnosed with HIV and started on antiretroviral therapy. About 10 years ago, started having rib pain and then that progressed to foot and leg pain. He was treated for gout, uh, had muscle wasting and a wide gait. Uh, an EMG showed polyneuropathy. Uh, he had some uh, insufficiency fractures seen on x-ray. He saw a whole host of different kinds of physicians and was treated in a variety of different ways and everything got worse. He eventually underwent two surgical procedures and well angioplasty procedures and bypass grafting for peripheral arterial disease to see if that would help. Nothing helped. And he ended up in a motorized wheelchair from uh, debilitation, uh, pain, and weakness. And at that point, imaging studies were obtained. Next slide. And the imaging studies, both the bone scan and over on the right, you see what are called looser lines, uh, which are pseudo fractures, demonstrated osteomalacia. So a diagnosis from imaging was made of osteomalacia, which means weakness of the bones. Next slide. And the differential diagnosis for osteomalacia, by far the most common cause worldwide is vitamin D deficiency, but it can be caused by calcium deficiency, uh, low phosphate in the blood, or certain kinds of drugs. Next slide. Uh, keep going with all the labs here. So he was not vitamin D uh, deficient. Uh, his calcium was normal, but his serum phosphate was very, very low. Interestingly, his creatinine is 1.05, which is normal, but has already been discussed. This person was muscle wasted and probably had some degree of renal insufficiency with the normal serum creatinine. But based on the low phosphate, he was referred to one of my colleagues uh, in the uh, Harborview Kidney Clinic for evaluation. Next slide. So this is uh, sort of his medications in history when he was being evaluated. A lot of over time, different antiretroviral uh, therapies, aspirin and a statin for his atherosclerosis, and then gabapentin, morphine, and trazodone for all the pain and weakness that he was having. Next slide. So he was referred to the nephrology clinic for evaluation of hypophosphatemia or low phosphate in the blood. And just over on the left-hand side, you can see sort of mass balance that we take in phosphate in the diet. Some of that gets excreted, it doesn't get absorbed into the body in the feces, but some of it gets absorbed where it then gets compartmentalized in the body. And then the kidneys are primarily responsible for maintaining mass balance of the absorbed phosphate. So when you have a low phosphorus, it can be due to an acute shift in compartments, but that's really in critical illness. It can be the so-called gut's fault because you don't absorb the phosphate in the diet, or it can be the kidney's fault because it doesn't uh, maintain phosphate balance in the body. Next slide. So the way that you tr try to figure out if it's from the gut or the kidney is to look at whether it's in the urine. If you have a low serum phosphorus and the kidneys are working well, they will reabsorb phosphate and the phosphate in the urine will be low. There's a test that we call the fractional excretion of phosphate. It should be less than 5%. Uh, uh, advance the slide, please. Um, yeah, and then this, whoop, go back. It was 36%. So this made a diagnosis of phosphate wasting by the kidney. Next slide. So the differential diagnosis, when you know it's the kidney's fault, it can be from too much parathyroid hormone or FGF23, another hormone-like substance, or uh, from a defect in how the proximal tubule is working and reabsorbing a variety of solutes that we call Fanconi syndrome. 
Next slide. So this was evaluated. His PTH was normal. His FGF23 was normal. He's had adequate vitamin D. And since Fanconi syndrome can also be caused by metal intoxication, a lead level was normal or from monoclonal gammopathies like multiple myeloma, uh, he did not have a monoclonal gammopathy. Next slide. So systemat, now interestingly, the clinicians in the renal clinic went back and looked and over 10 years time, he'd had urinalyses that showed considerable excess glucose, which is a sign of Fanconi syndrome that had been missed by all the clinicians taking care of the patient. And six years previously, he'd had a lower serum phosphate and uric acid as well. So th this had clearly been going on for many years. Next slide. So when we think about drug-induced Fanconi syndrome, which is proximal tubular injury, there are a variety of drugs that are known to do this, but the obvious candidate for this uh, uh, person was tenofovir, which is part of his antiretroviral therapy regimen. Uh, tenofovir uh, is uh, uh, taken up basolaterally, usually by O1, uh, and it's known that it can be nephrotoxic, particularly by affecting mitochondrial function. Next slide. And you can get uh, on biopsy, you can really see these sort of ballooned out abnormal mitochondria in the proximal tubule in tenofovir toxicity. Next slide. So is it, how nephrotoxic is it? Well, you get these sort of tubular defects. Uh, you can get Fanconi syndrome. You can get reversible acute kidney injury. It's sort of uh, questionable whether it directly causes chronic kidney disease or not. Uh, observational data suggests, yes, randomized trials. You can't show statistically that it does. Next slide. And I saw that uh, Dr. Schlepak is on this call. He's really led the efforts over the last more than a decade to really study biomarkers, so-called AKI and other biomarkers with tenofovir exposure, a whole series of patient, of papers like this. And bottom line, as I interpret them, is that it, any changes in AKI biomarkers are relatively modest uh, uh, at best. Uh, and really takes a whole panel to see any effect on the entire population treated uh, with uh, tenofovir uh, disaproxyl fumarate, TDF, which is the more nephrotoxic uh, form. And whether you could pick up a patient like this who's very susceptible is unclear via biomarkers. Next slide. Now, industry has made a uh, prodrug of tenofovir, uh, of TDF that's a much uh, less, pro should be much less nephrotoxic and more effective, tends to go uh, more to lymphocytes. It may not be a substrate for the oats, the organic anionic transporters on the beta basolateral surface of the proximal tubule, and it's very active against HIV. Next slide. But even though it's a better drug, there's very little data to show that you really get clinical benefit. And because it's a relatively rare event for patients to stop the older form of tenofovir for renal events, uh, it, uh, its utilization, we still see a lot of patients on the older form TDF, particularly because it's off patent, so it's much cheaper uh, than the newer drug. Next slide. So I'm going to sum up by just using this case to point out the challenges that we should all be focused on during this meeting. Just like we heard from uh, Becca and Marla about how devastating drug-induced kidney injury can be, here for this particular person, uh, he ended up in a motorized wheelchair uh, from the debilitating effects uh, from a, a drug-induced kidney injury. But this is not an easy, this was not an easy diagnosis to make. It's an indolent insidious onset that uh, if you were looking for it, you would have seen the clinical manifestations probably at least a decade before. It took at least nine years for clinicians to recognize the glycosuria that was there all the time. But uh, with all everything else going on, nobody took the time to look until he was referred to a nephrology clinic. The offending agent is uh, very effective as an antiviral, and it's a mainstay of therapy for HIV, Hep B, et cetera. Uh, and it only infrequently causes kidney problems. And it's not clear that uh, any of the panels of AKI biomarkers would have necessarily been helpful uh, in this case. We have no way of really knowing that. 
So I'll stop here and I just wanna illustrate uh, the challenges that we have and the importance of addressing this issue systematically as we're doing during this two day meeting. Thanks for your attention. And I'll turn it over to Joe. Great, thank you, Dr. Hart. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Joseph Bonventry. Um, Dr. Bonventry is the, the Samuel A. Levine Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical, Medical School, as well as a Professor of Health Sciences and Technology at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Bonventry's research focuses primarily on the study of kidney injury and repair, as well as signal transduction, with a special emphasis on the role of inflammation, biomarkers, and stem cells. I'll permit him to, to walk forward and, and step through his presentation around the need for biomarkers to inform drug safety decision making. Well, thank you. I'd like to build on some of the things that have already been said and uh, potentially um, uh, introduce some additional ways of looking at this uh, that will be built on uh, subsequently. And thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, the next slide is a, a disclosure slide and many of these interactions relate to uh, patient safety um, monitoring and biomarkers. Um, the next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, and all in 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about patient burden of drug-induced uh, kidney injury. Um, the fact that drug-induced kidney injury does not equal drug-induced AKI, which is important here. Uh, characteristics of useful biomarkers and some examples <clears throat> of cisplatinum and um, the FDA qualified safety bar uh, markers, which I think can be um, strongly built upon. The next slide. Okay, so this is just some of the uh, issue of patient burden. 14% um, uh, of all AKI in a multinational prospective study of uh, 1800 ICU patients, um, uh, of which uh, uh, about 57% developed AKI, 14% of this in the ICU was related to drugs and the incidence outside the ICU uh, for a number of reasons is higher than this. Um, in an observational study in China, for example, um, where they looked at 280,000 patients, hospitalized patients, the incidence of AKI was relatively low, but 37% of all AKI uh, was related uh, to drug-induced uh, acute kidney injury. And medications cause 70% of AKI um, associated with um, acute interstitial nephritis. And 50% of patients with acute interstitial nephritis develop chronic kidney disease. So there's not only the acute issue, which has already been touched upon, but the, um, the chronic issue, which has also been uh, touched upon. And again, in this context of drug-induced acute kidney injury, uh, this is defined by KDGO criteria, uh, that is changes in serum, creatinine, and, and urine volume. So it's, um, it's not the same as drug-induced kidney injury. Uh, it's a subset of kidney injury, which is associated with an increase in serum creatinine in most cases, or in all cases. The next slide. Okay, and this makes this point again. So drug-induced AKI, with an increase in creatinine. And uh, when it's been looked at, um, in some cases, it, you know, it can be defined also by a reduction in urine output. But this is really um, sort of the tip of the iceberg, as they say, whereas drug-induced kidney function, kidney injury rather, can, as Jonathan just pointed out, uh, change function of the kidney in, in the patient that he presented um, clearly over time, the creatinine went up, but didn't go up very high. Uh, it was only, I think, 1.05, but probably that was related to, um, to his um, uh, emaciated state. Um, but there can also, in drug-induced kidney injury, there's also increased tissue abnormalities, um, which if you looked at the kidney with a biopsy, you would see them, uh, but you can't tell necessarily from uh, non-invasive other other tests or even radiographical tests. Um, and, and with drug-induced kidney injury, uh, the notion is that you can pick them up with injury biomarkers, um, whereas you couldn't pick this up by uh, looking at a change in creatinine necessarily. Okay, so AKI criteria, 
the tip of the iceberg, um, the patient fulfills those criteria, um, but in the most in most cases, uh, <clears throat> or in particularly early on uh, in the disease process, um, they do not fill the criteria for AKI. The next slide. Okay, so then drug-induced kidney injury is, um, is associated, obviously has an overlap with drug-induced AKI, uh, but there's a good percentage of drug-induced kidney injury that's not drug-induced AKI. The next slide. And so what are the characteristics of useful Dickey biomarkers? We want biomarkers with the following characteristics. This is just a, a subset, but I think helpful. We want it to be sensitive to enable early diagnosis of uh, injury. We want it to be specific with minimal false positives. We'd like the biomarker to provide some insight into the kidney site of injury and have a direct relationship with the severity of injury. And finally, we'd like it to be able to predict or not necessarily it, but biomarkers um, or a group of them to predict how likely the injury is to result in chronic kidney disease and or its progression. The goal of course has been stated already uh, to protect patients and to facilitate drug development, uh, not only for kidney related drugs, but for drugs for other diseases, um, where many of which have associated side effects relating to kidney toxicity. The next slide. And this is a <clears throat> partial list of biomarkers that we have right now uh, with varying degrees of, um, of study associated with them. Uh, we have markers of the proximal tubule, we have glomerular markers, um, we have loop of Henle distal tubules collecting ducts, and markers, um, non-invasive, for example, urinary markers of, um, of interstitial disease. And this is just a, a, partial, a partial list, but it gives us a great deal to work with. The next slide. Okay, I think. So we may have missed one, but um, okay. So then, then one before that, one before that, before that. No, okay, next slide. Okay, next slide, please. And so here's an example. This was a study that uh, we actually haven't published, but this was a study done in 20 year olds with testicular cancer. And, and in, uh, there were five different courses of cisplatinum uh, therapy in, in, um, in response to the five days of treatment with each course. Um, there was no change in serum creatinine. In fact, there was no change in serum creatinine from the beginning to the end of uh, the study. But you can see with each uh, treatment uh, regimen, there were increases in, in, in this case, KIM-1 and, and, and acetyl glucosaminidase. Um, when normalized to creatinine. And in each case, the, um, the values came back toward baseline, but note there was an upward drift. Now, whether these kind of results have long-term sequelae, we don't know yet, but one could imagine that this upward drift may be relevant in terms of predicting hypertension in these individuals uh, over time or more severe aspects of, um, of chronic kidney disease, or also more uh, susceptibility to other insults um, over time. The next slide. So this again shows, uh, it's already been mentioned by, by Frank, um, but the, the FDA qualified uh, safety biomarker panel for uh, phase one, studies uh, in normal volunteers. Um, but a, a good deal of study was done with these patients and, um, and it serves as an example of what can be accomplished. And my own feeling is that, that these markers from all that we know uh, should be useful um, in phase two and phase three studies, and also just to develop paradigms for patient safety in general. Um, next slide. 
and and this is part of the um, the FDA recommendation was to uh, to combine uh, and have a relatively uh, straightforward composite measure using these six uh, biomarkers. Uh, the next slide. Okay, so what has held up progress? Um, again, so much has um, has relied on the definition of AKI, which relies uh, in most cases, um, especially when there's no urine output available on changes in serum creatinine. Um, and we've already heard that creatinine changes are not sensitive. Injury can occur without changes in serum creatinine. There's limited specificity. Um, serum creatinine can increase for reasons other than injury. Uh, for example, such as interference with transporters in the proximal tubule that normally secrete creatinine and um, are not really informative. The change in creatinine is not very informative with respect to the site of injury. Uh, we want biomarkers that are sensitive, specific, and provide insight into the site and character of the kidney injury. Next slide. Um, how do we get there? Well, understand the utility of currently known putative biomarkers, which I've already mentioned, or discover new biomarkers or both. So next slide. And how do we understand? And this has already been talked about, um, but analyzing data from multiple publicly available sources where biomarkers have been measured and related to kidney injury and drug exposure, um, gain access to non-published data um, where biomarkers have been measured. And this has already been mentioned with respect to trying to um, develop a consortia and, and very strong involvement of the pharmaceutical industry that has a, a lot of these data. And then measure biomarkers prospectively in clinical uh, studies. But as Frank pointed out, these take um, a, a good deal of time. And we have a, a good deal of data already, uh, although not uh, not all accessible at this point. Next slide. And this, <clears throat> this is my next to last slide. Um, and this is a from um, LEPTAC et al. Um, and, and this relates to uh, evidentiary criteria, in particular in the context of qualification. But I would argue that um, this, this whole um, discussion uh, in the next two days is not really focusing on qualification per se. Uh, but one could also think about this in the context of, of the acceptance by the community. You know, what's the need? When is it gonna be used? What's the risk benefit analysis? And what kind of evidence does the community need to use a biomarker, which um, you know, overlaps a great deal with the kind of evidence uh, that the FDA would need um, in order to qualify a biomarker. So this structure can be uh, useful in terms of thinking about a community use and bringing biomarkers uh, to the fore so that we can um, uh, reduce risks to patients and enhance drug development. So the next slide, I think is just, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I think Vishal is the next speaker. And he's gonna talk about KHI and maybe some other things. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Von um, And so our next speaker is Dr. Vishal Bhatia. He is a, a, a scientist at Pfizer currently, where he's held leadership roles with increasing responsibilities in drug safety and now in cl um, early clinical development with the remit of, a, of applying biomarker science to achieve confidence in translational safety, clinical proof of mechanism, and patient stratification for candidates across all therapeutic areas. And so um, with that, Vishal, I will pass it over to you right now to, to walk us through your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I feel we are in the defining the challenge block, but I do feel uh, it has been elegantly defined by Joe, Jonathan, uh, Aliza, and Frank. Uh, the urgency and the purpose of what we are doing, why we are doing was also very elegantly defined by the two patients, Marla and Becca. What I'm going to do is the next step. Now that we have defined the problem, what is the action plan that we can accomplish 
to come at some solutions towards the problem. And then again, Frank pointed out, it took first 10 years to get the non-clinical biomarkers qualified, then the next 10 years. Our hope is to do all of this in the five years. We are ambitious uh, in terms of defining this roadmap as a five-year plan and an actionable plan to get forward to the next and third step. So next slide, please. It is uh, what I'm going to show today is the work by Kidney Health Initiative, which is a public-private partnership between American Society of Pathology, US FDA, and 100, greater than 100 member organizations. Of course, there is the same disclaimer that Nick used. The opinions are just of the authors and not of any other organizations. Next slide, please. I want to start by first thanking the core member team that worked on this five-year roadmap. And this is laid out here. We worked over the last 12 to 15 months to come up with all the points that one can think of, well, we think all the points, that one can think of towards defining this roadmap, which is an actionable plan for the next three to five years. It can be done early, but it's just a plan uh, towards a three to five year strategy. I will also thank all the full list of contributors who sort of took our plan and reviewed it from their own independent unbiased lens in terms of what are we missing and they provided feedback and then we incorporated. So a big thanks to all of the members here. I'm just representing the team and I was lucky to be a part of this core team. Next slide, please. Today's purpose is again to make you aware of this synergistic efforts to provide an update and to give you sort of a sneak peek at this plan, which is going to be publicly available in a few weeks from now. Uh, next slide, please. Kidney Health KHI uh, developed this roadmap again, knowing the problem that was very elegantly defined in the last two hours when this meeting started. Our goal is to have this roadmap guide the community of what the action plan looks like in the next five years and, and come up with some meaningful uh, and impactful solutions towards this problem. Next slide, please. This roadmap essentially goes into three aspects. One is current state, which we all know, and I'm not gonna go through it uh, in the next slide. Uh, the most important is actions encouraged by the roadmap. And then the third is desired result. Again, we are aware of what the result could look like, but I'm just gonna talk about it very quickly. Next slide, Nick. Yeah, this is again, uh, we talked about it. The challenges with serum creatinine being insensitive, being nonspecific, certainly it is not mechanistic. We don't know what is happening inside the kidney or what is happening on a cellular level in terms of perturbations with the current markers. When we get better markers, we can help in diagnosing, monitoring, predicting, identifying patient stratification and, and many more things. So that's the current state. The next slide, please. As a result of this, what are the actions? So the key actions that are triggered uh, uh, in this roadmap are how can we assess the utility of kidney injury biomarkers for diagnosis? I feel we talked a lot about data sharing. One step before that is data collection and data interpretation. And how do we start collecting the data? What is the relevant context in terms of collecting the data? Are we collecting and then are we sharing? That's where we are trying to go. And then when we are collecting, do we know how to interpret it? One biomarker, two biomarker, six biomarker, in what state, what time point, uh, and in terms of long-term outcomes. We are also defining what are the impediments to broader usage of these biomarkers once the data becomes available, or even today, what are the impediments? A broad, again, ambitious goal is to redefine AKI. As Joe elegantly pointed out, there are two things, drug-induced AKI and then drug-induced kidney injury. Both of them, or many of them, even today rely on serum creatinine. So the goal here is, should we start thinking about redefining AKI using the knowledge that we gain using the biomarkers? In addition to the traditional biomarkers, there might be a place where we might rethink of do we even need current biomarkers, but we are not there yet. This roadmap tells us Let's start looking at that aspect. Let's start redefining it with the new knowledge that comes out of this traditional bio, uh, of these new biomarkers. Next slide, please. And this is the desired result. I mean, the big word, again, emphasized before is injury here. And injury does happen in the context of drug, and that's what we are talking about, and that's what this meeting is focused on. But injury also happens in the absence of drug. And therefore, there are strategies to mitigate that by developing AKI protective drugs. Well, guess what? These biomarkers will also be significantly useful for that. Imagine the third bullet here showcases these biomarkers will be useful for mitigating kidney safety concerns in healthy volunteers across all therapeutic areas. The first bullet tells you if you're developing a kidney protective drug, these biomarkers can be useful to tell you 
proof of mechanism in a phase two trial, target engagement, or even early signs of efficacy. So that's a huge bonus here. And it's a two-sided coin, safety and efficacy. And we'll be, my hope is we'll be using, we'll be able to use these biomarkers quantitatively for both of those aspects. The third aspect is, again, you can use these markers for patient stratification. Are there specific patient sets that we can go after to enrich the trial design based on these bio, or more biomarkers uh, so that the trial becomes much more efficient, nimble, and faster? The last is, of course, we are going to try to improve patient care, uh, regardless of age, sex, gender. And these biomarkers hopefully will allow us to go beyond uh, these, these covariates that usually sometimes impact uh, traditional biomarkers too. Next slide, please. This is how the, the entire roadmap is laid out. There is a need for AKI biomarkers. There is a vision. Then there are specific action items, and that's where the meat is. It's a timeline-based, three-year plan, a five-year plan. What can be done today? What can be done two years from now? And what can be done five years from now? It's a specific timeline-driven plan around these actions that we can take as a community starting today. Then there are challenges to accelerating these biomarker development that exist today, and we all can overcome those challenges. And we have certain steps that are laid out to say that, how can we overcome these challenges? The most important, another important thing is also AKI biomarker use cases so that it's not just language, we're also defining here is a use case uh, and here is how you would deploy the biomarkers and here is how the outcome will look like. Uh, next slide, please. And this is visual representation of what this biomarker looks like. I mean, it's a 50, 60 page document, but I feel this is the most important visual aspect which shows you roadmap, where to start, where to end, and what are the benefits. And I'll maybe in the next five minutes, I'll go through just the four aspects that highlight in this. The top one, next slide, please. I will zoom it up in all of those four aspects. The top one is assess the utility of kidney biomarkers. Again, we know that the, some of these biomarkers have shown promise in non-clinical studies, also in clinical studies, and also in the translation of non-clinical to clinical. But are we assessing the utility in a clinical trial? And if we are, then how do we share it? And can we have use cases for that? Then the question is, what are the techniques we are using? I mean, if, if we can share, but if everybody's using different techniques, you know, then are we, allow, are we able to interpret whatever data comes out of different trials, different methods, uh, different times that they are done in different places that they are done. So how do you interpret that? And do we have a biomarker statistical analysis plan, so to speak, that, that can be harmonized and uniformly accepted by everyone? The third goes into overcoming impediments for broader usage. I mean, one thing that comes to my mind quickly is if you're going to deploy this in clinical trials and it is conducted globally, do all the clinical research operation unit CROs are they ready to deploy these biomarkers in a very consistent, unified way? Do we have reference ranges for these biomarkers that will help in, uh, in interpreting it? And then the last bucket is, uh, again, I had mentioned this before, redefining AKI using the new biomarker knowledge that we get in conjunction with the traditional markers today. Next slide, please. This is the meat of the roadmap, which is an action plan. We can undertake, all of us can undertake, whether we are in industry, academia, uh, uh, or another, other healthcare regulatory authorities, all of us can take these actions and to, towards achieving the roadmap goals. The first is optimizing biomarker testing and integrate uh, appropriate biomarker use in new and ongoing studies. If we have them internally, if we have them externally, how do we incorporate these biomarkers without being shy or afraid that, that Frank, uh, Put, there, put out there as a point. Uh, second is collaborate on biobanking. I mean, the, many of the industries or outside industries too are rich on biobanking, uh, whether it is serum samples, whether it is urine samples, they're collected over many clinical trials. And that is a very rich biospecimen source that we should tap into. The company that I work on, uh, work at is Pfizer, and we have started doing something around this. And you will hear uh, about this interesting talk tomorrow from Shashi in the afternoon. The third is again, biomarkers uh, that can better define and predict AKI and its phenotype. The fourth is coordinated effort. Nick nicely pointed out there are three paths. One is a drug development tool. The other is uh, publications. And the third is towards a normal NDA BLA submission. But, that is a, but we can do that in a coordinated way too, which might accelerate it. Uh, the fourth is develop AKI biomarker guidance document so that nobody has to worry about it, whether it is small biotech academia or 
whoever is trying to develop a drug, if I collect the data, how do I interpret it? So if there is a guidance document, uh, it's fantastic. And there is a nice guidance document for composite panel right now, which makes it very easy to understand. If I get this, if I have X number of patients, and if I get um, X fold, Y fold increase, how do I interpret that data? So more of this should be available. The last is increase awareness. Once we have enough data, we can increase awareness of these benefits. And the last is uh, focus on community effort. Next, next slide, please. Uh, you know, we have challenges. Uh, it has been laid out before. And, and the goal now over the next five years is how do we overcome these challenges? And I feel all of us attending this meeting, presenting at this meeting, or who are a part of strategic plan should be held accountable uh, in the next three to five years to how did we overcome the challenge that we laid out in 2022? This document goes towards that and it has details on how to overcome the challenges. There are technical challenges, there are implementation challenges I alluded to, uh, and then we will look at it and see how best to overcome those challenges. The last slide, uh, Nick, is the next one, which you know goes around a success, meaning when all of this is done three to five years from now, what would, what would an ideal situation looks like? It is, uh, we'll be able to diagnose and monitor much better. We'll be able to predict which patients will have a positive response, thereby enriching the clinical trial and so on and so forth. So we have talked about it. There's also this unmet need where uh, there is a nine-fold increase of AKI patients to develop CKD and then three-fold increase of AKI patients to develop or to progress chronic kidney disease. And can these biomarkers influence that too so that we can catch the disease early on before it progresses? So there are many benefits that will come out of it. And our hope is to uh, implement now the strategic plan. Uh, next slide, which is the last slide, which just encourages you to go towards this. Uh, this will be made public. And, and again, I tell you, we should all be held accountable to to overcome these challenges and implement and follow the roadmap because there are detailed actions around it. Thank you. And I'll pass it to James Deere now, uh, who will who'll elaborate more on this topic. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. But I'd like to introduce next Dr. James Deere, who is a professor um, in clinical toxicology at the University of Edinburgh and he's performing translational research um, at, at the University of Edinburgh. So I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much. Yeah, so as you said, my name's James Deere. And I'm based over across the Atlantic in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And for the next 10 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about two main points, and that is the importance of defining the context of use and understanding where the point of care really is for patients. And this is very much based on my own experience, um, my own sort of bitter experience of, of, of success and failure. So on the slide in front of you, you see a man called Tony Fidel, who I heard interviewed recently. Uh, now, Tony Fidel co-created the first iPod, which was way back now in 2001. And there's been a lot of talk about this because the iPod's gone off the market. Uh, and he was asked by the audience for his best piece of advice for, for future designers. Uh, and I think it is quite helpful to think of biomarker development in a design context, which is something I'll come back to. And the point he made was make sure that whatever you're designing is designing for a problem that is a major problem. So make sure that you understand the problem. And the analogy he gave was, make sure you're designing a painkiller that's going to really ease the pain in, in our case, in drug development, in patient care. And you're not just de designing a vitamin, something that's nice to take, but really doesn't have that much clear benefit. So I think certainly in my biomarker work over time, I've perhaps overlooked at times the importance of really understanding the clinical problem and, and not until recently thought of myself more as a designer as opposed to other things. Uh, next slide please. So I think the situation where we are at the moment is that there's a huge technological push as we all know in terms of what's possible in biomarker discovery. There are lots of omic technology, the state of the art, we can do more and more. And 
I've certainly been in the position where you have banks of samples in freezers and you apply the omics technology and you find new markers or new potential markers. But perhaps the clinical pull hasn't quite got the same balance as a technological push, at least, at least in my experience. So the next slide, please. And really that's what I think this talk um, is aiming to stimulate in this workshop. And that is a, a consideration of what are the great unmet needs and can we pre precisely define them? So next slide, please. And really what I'm talking about is exactly that. We need to define the unmet clinical need. Now, many of you will be familiar already, and I think this paper's already been alluded to, and it's a paper that really changed the way I think about biomarker development. And that is giving the, the formal qualification pathway, but I very much agree with the previous speakers that I think this is a pathway to how we can all develop biomarkers, both for formal qualification but also by, for acceptance by by the field and really the importance of this paper to me is is defining the importance of the need statement and the context of use from which how much evidence needs to be generated can be determined next slide please so i work particularly on i've got to not say paracetamol i've got to say acetaminophen given the audience I work particularly on acetaminophen toxicity. The reason I work particularly on that is multiple, but one of the main reasons being it's very, very common in where I live. So having reflected on, on the papers defining the context of use, we, we went out and we defined the context of use before we looked for biomarkers. And here's what we came up with in this context. Now, it's not really there to be directly relevant to this this meeting but it's there just to make the point that we became very specific about what we were looking for before we started the discovery process so we wanted a sensitive biomarker and we defined the sensitivity that we would require to go forward we defined the time after drug exposure that it must be that sensitive and how it must change the patient pathway next slide please and from that, we went on to publish a target product profile, which was something I wasn't familiar with doing, I'll be honest. But I found it incredibly helpful to define what does the marker need to do in order to be a success? And we went on and published that. Next slide, please. And from that now, we have funding to actually design the point of care test. A lateral flow assay that we'll all be familiar with in times of COVID combined with Raman spectroscopy. Now, the details of this don't really matter. The point I'm making is that we started with a clearly defined context of use and built from there. Next slide, please. So the key thing I think to think about is who, who needs input into the context of use and what we found was that there are stakeholders, if you like, who we're all very familiar with. Doctors, in this case, pharma companies, regulators, uh, university tran tech transfer officers, obviously bench scientists. But there were also people who transformed this project. First one being patients. Having the patient voice in this project from the start made the difference. What I found was what I think is important often isn't what the patient thinks is important. The second people were designers. Uh, I mean, companies that make stuff and bringing them in at the start and saying, we want to find a solution for this problem already they were bringing up issues that I hadn't thought about in terms of what the end product will look like. And the final group that I found very important, very useful, very stimulating are global health specialists. So we talk and we'll talk a lot today, we'll talk about 
drug development. We'll talk about predominantly the USA and Europe. But drug toxicity is a big problem globally. I'm particularly interested in liver toxicity, and that's particularly a problem in Africa. And so starting with engagement globally about, OK, I'm trying to develop a solution. How do I make that usable and relevant to a global market? I need to consider cost. I need to consider other factors. And building that in from the start, again, was transformative. Next slide, please. Now, the other point that, that often comes up is um, from companies, and companies will often say, I'm making a point of care test. But I think the question here often is, where is the point of care? Within the context of use, within the case you're building, within the biomarker you're developing, understanding where it's going to be measured. Is it going to be measured in the emergency department when a patient comes in? If it is measured in the emergency department, is it, does it need to be measured next to the patient? Or can it go to the hospital lab and come back? Will it be measured in an outpatient setting, in a specialist hospital, a general hospital? Will it be measured in the doctor's surgery on the high street of a, of a town? Will it be measured at home? And I think that's a particularly interesting market. And given what's happened with COVID and the familiarity we have with home testing, I think we will see a large increase in home diagnostics. But if the, if the point of care is home testing, the assay you're developing, the market you're developing is a very different creature. And also to say, as I said before, thinking about low and middle income countries, will you be using the marker globally? How different will the assay be if it's used, for instance, in this photo in Africa, where resources are very different. Next slide, please. Now, I don't need to say to this audience about um, acute and chronic kidney disease. Many people have talked about this already. All I would say is that time is clearly a factor here. So in the acute setting, which I've given the example of enrichment for a phase two clinical trial, time to result is a key factor. You need actionable information back quickly. Whereas in a more chronic setting, it is less of a factor. And it may be that the result can go to the lab, can take a week to come back, and the patient can be seen in clinic the next week with the result. So as well as point of care, the time pressure is important to understand. How quickly does the result need to be back? Next slide, please. So this is a summary, the final slide of this talk. And it's been short and it's really just making two points that, that I've learned over time, is we really need to develop, and I hope we do over the next two days, a deep understanding of what the need really is. And I've been guilty in the past of thinking that I understand what the clinical need is, but I've learned very much the hard way to build multidisciplinary teams where Lots of people give input early on and you really get an understanding of what is needed. And within that, the second question is thinking from the start about where the biomarker will be measured. Do you really need a point of care test next to the patient's bedside? Could the marker be measured at home or could it go to a specialist lab? And bringing that in and that design consideration in early, again, has been transformative for us. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So we'd like to move on to our, our next presentation. And this is by Dr. Gary Friedman, who is the clinical chair on the Kidney Safety Council and the director for inflammation and immunology at Pfizer um, Incorporated. He also works with uh, the Predictive Safety Testing Consortium on our kidney safety project and qualification. Biomarkers. Nick, thank you very much. And first, the sound check. Am I coming across clearly? Very clearly. Great. So I have uh, some good pieces of news. Number one uh, is that uh, my uh, talk will be abbreviated 
not just for the sake of time and getting us onto uh, the schedule that you so nicely created, but because all the predecessor speakers have really done such a great job of really defining uh, exactly what it is that we need to accomplish starting the day after this teleconference. Uh, and so I'm going to keep my uh, presentation very, very brief, and I'm really looking forward to the breakout sessions. Um, and uh, just my disclaimers are listed here. It is, however, uh, my honor and privilege um, to um, be uh, working with uh, the Critical Path Institute uh, and so many of the speakers uh, who've already presented this morning. And I have the honor of, of chairing the um, uh, the adjudication committee, which uh, in the coming weeks uh, will be assessing the biomarker data from two prospective uh, clinical trials. And these are the biomarkers um, that uh, Joe Bonaventure and others have shown already in their uh, presentations. These biomarkers are being used prospectively uh, in two trials where patients were exposed uh, to nephrotoxic agents because of a, a life-threatening medical condition that they had. Uh, and those 200 patients worth of data will become available through an anonymized database source that we'll be speaking to more about this afternoon. Uh, next slide. I really could not agree more with uh, uh, Dr. James Deere and a few others who've spoken in order to have meaningful information about patients, you need to have meaningful numbers of study participants, and you need to be able to get their perspective before you ever kick off a clinical study. Uh, and so once you have patient understanding of what is at stake, meaning, do you have a new tool here that can really make a difference in their lives, uh, in the lives of the physicians taking care of them uh, and their ability to make timely decisions uh, and then plan for the future? And if you have the understanding from patients, from their physicians who are taking care of them, and if you have the input from so many many of the leaders in nephrology that you've heard already speak, then and only then can clinical trial uh, sponsors uh, like Major Pharma, only then can meaningful outcomes uh, come forward that then will make differences in not just the participants in the study's lives, uh, but well beyond that. And Nick, I'm going to skip ahead and go to the next slide and the next slide. Keep going. Keep going. Yes, keep going. I don't want to scare anybody with that one. And keep going. So, as Winston Churchill once said, it's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. So, everything you've heard about today thus far, and this will be my final slide, shows you that we're no longer going to be behind the eight ball when we describe the sharing of data that not only could go on, but will go on um, uh, almost immediately. Uh, we're not going to be waiting years to share these uh, biomarker sets of data uh, from real live clinical situations. Uh, we will move beyond in very short time period, we will utilize, yes, patient reported outcomes that we've been reliant upon. We'll utilize clinician reported outcomes. We'll use all the standard biomarkers that we're so familiar with. But the future state is not so far in the future. It's really right now, as everybody has been describing. So in addition to all of those olden days sources of data, we will have novel biomarker data that has already been generated. We will have that shared into the biomarker data repository, which we'll talk a bit more about this afternoon. And then with the initial um, seeding of that biomarker data repository, uh, and then the continuous infusion of data, not only by pharma, but by academic researchers um, and others, we will then be able to apply um, 
artificial intelligence and machine learning to those growing data sets and really generate from there because we will have a broad swath of, uh, of the, the human population across the planet. We will have representative uh, data from representative uh, individuals from uh, both males and females across every racial and ethnic designation, across the full age spectrum and across the entire EGFR uh, spectrum. So this very, very arduous push up the hill is now at a tipping point uh, and we are going to have the data to be able to really prognosticate about the future and we'll be able to continue to grow the number of biomarkers based upon the existing biomarker data sets uh, that we will have in hand very shortly. And with that, Nick, I'm going to stop so that we can move on uh, to the next set of speakers. And thanks for this opportunity. Great. Thanks very much, Jared. We appreciate your perspective and look forward to hearing more from you today. Our, our next talk is going to be by Dr. Stefan Sultana. Um, Dr. Sultana works as a, a kidney toxicity expert in the patient safety group at AstraZeneca. He has uh, 25 years worth of experience in pharma companies and has been an active member of various consortia working in kidney safety biomarkers over the past 14 years. So I look forward to his uh, talk on, on addressing portions of leveraging biomarkers in clinical trials. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Stefan. Thank you, Nick. Sound check. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Nick. Thank you to the Clinical Path Institute and FDA for inviting me to, to participate in today's session. And I'll walk us through uh, some of the slides rather quickly because the points have been covered by previous speakers. So go to the next slide, please. So some of the points I'd like to cover are what do we currently use um, in clinical trials, specifically in clinical, clinical trial uh, cl cl um, drug development uh, as renal safety monitoring tools, talk to you about the composite measure, which has been alluded to by a couple of previous speakers, uh, which has been qualified, um, and then go through my own personal take on some of the barriers and challenges to using uh, renal safety biomarkers in clinical trials. And again, my personal take on where we should take this field in the future. Next slide. So standard lab measures include creatinine, uh, urinalysis, uh, with or without serum cystatin C, with or without urine or total protein to creatinine ratio as monitoring tools in most programs where you've got a, a concern about renal safety. We've been through, uh, Joe very eloquently uh, highlighted uh, the whole uh, problem about classification about AKI, acute kidney injury, and Frank has previously alluded to the fact that you have to lose more than half your kidney function before you see any significant elevation of serum creatinine, and that's seen uh, dramatically in nephrectomies where, you do, where pat uh, patients are giving up a kidney in a live donor kidney transplant, where these patients hardly see any significant change in serum creatinine and any changes settle down after a few days. And then I think James and others have highlighted in the past uh, previously that you got a significant time lag before you see a significant elevation of serum creatinine. So in an acute setting, when, when time matters to minimize the damage to the kidney and also to implement recovery as early as possible, it really matters uh, that you have early and sensitive markers of kidney injury. Next slide. <clears throat> Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was frozen for a second. No there. worries, yeah. no worries. Um, so we have been using kidney injury biomarkers in the context of drug development, and we've been using them on a case-by-case -case basis in single and multiple ascending dose phase one studies, and in relatively small and well-controlled phase 2A studies as well. And a number of different biomarkers have been described in literature and have been used at least by the three pharma companies that I've been involved with over my longer career. These are just some of the ones which we've used in the past. 
alpha-1 and beta-2 macroglobulins and others. Typically, your patient study will measure one or two biomarkers, and the decisions that you make on the basis of these biomarkers tend to be exploratory decisions, um, and the choice of the biomarker tends to be driven by the pattern you've seen in non-clinical toxicology studies. So we have started to use these biomarkers, but we haven't shared those data widely across the industry. Next slide, please. There's been three milestones in the in the biomarker development world uh, for the for the kidneys side. I think Frank might have taken us through some of this already. But in 2008, there was a, a PSTC consortium uh, submitted a body of data which allowed the qualification of injury markers in the rats, and those same biomarkers can be used for case but for case by case use uh, in clinical studies as well. Back in 2016, the IMI Safety Consortium did a, a large body of work and submitted a letter of support uh, qualification package, a data package to, to uh, FDA and DMA and get, got letters of support for, for these uh, six biomarkers plus albumin plus total protein, which are listed here. And about 18 months ago, uh, PSTC and FNIH um, submitted uh, a large data package, which allowed the qualification of a biomarker panel, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. So I won't go into that here. If we go to the next slide. Ah, OK. Before we leave the topic, um, before we go to the next topic, uh, I just wanted to highlight that I, Frank um, mentioned this already. but. I think it's quite important that we focus on translational safety biomarkers. And what do we mean by that? We mean that biomarkers which work both in an animal species and in man, so that you can actually monitor in animals whether a change is expected to occur in the biomarker before you start using that same monitoring tool in humans, because obviously you want to be sure that the toxicity you're particularly worried about will be uh, changed by the by, uh, the biomarker, uh, will, will reflect changes uh, in humans as well. Um, so go to the next slide, please. So let's talk about the, the composite measure, which is the phase one healthy volunteer biomarker panel. Uh, next slide, please. So these are, this is a panel of six biomarkers um, qualified by the FDA uh, back in September of 2018. And this qualification was based on data from two studies. One's a non-drug biomarker study in healthy volunteers, male and female, older and younger uh, volunteers, 18, 81 uh, subjects in total. And the second was a retrospective uh, study uh, where samples were collected from patients with mesothelioma, a lung condition, a malignant condition of the pleura of the lung, where these patients were treated with intraoperative thoracic splashing of cisplatin um, into the lung cavity uh, during radical surgery. The biomarker, the, the composite measure consists of the panel itself, the six biomarkers you can see listed there, cluster and cystatin C, KIM1, and NAG, NGAL, and osteopontin. The formula by which to calculate the composite measure and the set of thresholds uh, by which you can detect renal injury based on the cohort size uh, of your study. Next slide, please. And these are the six biomarkers, um, which I, I know that Joe had in one of his slides. The only reason, the only point I want to make in this particular slide is that the six biomarkers actually cover different biological functions within the kidney. What do I mean by that? Uh, one of the biomarkers, cystatin C, is, is a protein which is filtered through the kidney and is normally reabsorbed almost fully within the kidney tubular app um, apparatus, epithelium. Uh, when the kidney is injured and when the tubule is not functioning the way it's normally meant to be functioning, it accumulates and is present in elevated levels uh, inside, the, inside the urine. Others, like for example, NAG, they're normally present in, inside the epithelium of the kidney. Um, they, they, when the cell bursts during injury, it's released into the urine and can come out uh, with increased levels uh, in the urine as well. 
Osteopontin represents the repair mechanism of the kidney, um, and it, it is elevated during times of stress in the kidney and repair mechanisms when they kick in. So you can see that the different biomarkers, we have to think about holistically about what a biomarker is doing. And when you're putting together a biomarker panel, ideally you're selecting biomarkers from different functional classes so that you can get a holistic picture of what's going on in the kidney. Next slide, please. The composite measure is qualified for use uh, to monitor in, in uh, phase one uh, healthy volunteer studies in conjunction with standard uh, renal lab safety tests. So it's very important to stress that you will still be measuring your, your normal standard lab safeties. Um, and in fact, a positive result on these lab uh, tests will normally trump any result you get with the biomarker. You should be using it when you've seen toxicity either in the drug class or else in the in the toxicity studies with this particular compound that you're coming you bring into development and it can be used to guide cohort dose escalation in single and multiple ascending dose studies when routine safety as, sa safety assessments have been normal it's important to stress that this particular composite measure uh, is not qualified for safety monitoring of individual healthy volunteers or for use in phase two studies. Next slide, please. This is the decision tree um, which we use when we're applying this biomarker. You need to look for and test the biomarker in preclinical studies and show that you get a biomarker pattern which corresponds to the toxicity in a preclinical species. And then if, if the preclinical species does predict, uh, the, the biomarker pattern does predict the toxicity, you can then use it safely to monitor a man and you will use the biomarker to, to guide uh, escalation to the next dose level once you've completed the dose cohort. Um, assuming that serum creatinine and all the other safety labs have been normal, you then look at the biomarker data and see whether that exceeds the threshold, which might suggest an injury response. Next slide, please. How do we use the composite measure? You calculate the, 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 an individual CM for one volunteer based on change from baseline of the six biomarkers at that particular time point. It's important to stress that the biomarkers are creatinine corrected, so they're normalized to the urine creatinine concentration. Um, the second step will be to calculate the geometric mean of all composite measures for the volunteers of that particular dose cohort at that respective time point. And you, you repeat this step for all the time points in your study. You then look at the, com the composite measure itself against the threshold that you've chosen uh, for, that particular, uh, for that particular dose cohort. Um, now, <clears throat> There are actually a number of thresholds included in qualification because it, it caters for study designs with or without uh, an equivalent placebo group. You've got a threshold for each of those scenarios. You also have different thresholds based on the number of subjects that you're enrolling in each dose cohort, going from an N of six all the way up to an N of 20 or more, um, which is quite unusual in a phase one study, um, but it covers for all, it caters for all, all probabilities. And it also has different thresholds based on the probability that you want to apply to your test as to how likely it is that the threshold is it being exceeded uh, due to chance. Um, so you select your threshold based on the design, the cohort size, and the probability. Next slide, please. How do you interpret the results? Well, first of all, you look at creatinine and standard labs and see if they show a signal. And if they do, then your whatever your biomarker is showing, uh, you need to look for an alternative explanation before you can safely go up to the next dose level. If your safety labs are normal and your composite measure has, has exceeded the threshold, that means that the biomarker data are inconsistent with the expected variability for those six biomarkers uh, in that particular se setting. So this could represent a kidney injury event, but it's not automatically an injury event. You have to look at it. So for example, if you get an isolated 
uh, elevation in one or two time points which are not contiguous. It could be that the, the, you had something in the study design which just caused a bit of excess variability in that composite measure at that particular point in time. So you look across the multiple time points and you look at the pattern over time. And if you do see an elevation, you actually look to see which biomarkers of the six are driving that composite measure elevation to see whether there could be some potential that your drug is causing some pharmacological effects, not injury, which might impact that particular biomarker. If at the end of all of this, you think that you have an injury signal, you see whether you've met your study criteria for stopping the study. Next slide, please. Now, PSTC and FNIH are working on the same six biomarkers that have been qualified for healthy volunteers, plus total protein, plus albumin and urine, to assess them, and uh, Gary referred to this uh, already, to assess them in a patient setting. And that work is still ongoing. And once that biomarker is qualified for patient studies, we can extend the renal safety monitoring both into patient studies as well as healthy volunteer studies, but also to safety monitoring of individual patient study participants, um, not just whole cohorts, which is what the composite measure can do at the moment. It's important to stress that even with this newer qualification, once it comes about, we will still be limited to study participants who have normal renal function. We haven't yet studied patients who come into studies with, um, with low renal reserve, with chronic kidney disease, as was uh, illustrated by Marla in the, in the very beginning of this, uh, of this workshop. And hopefully the patient data will come with thresholds and guideposts to, to, uh, to, to allow for the interpretation of biomarker data. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are some of Stefan's uh, barriers and challenges um, for using safety biomarkers in clinical studies? Next slide, please. So for qualified biomarkers, these are the bio, this is the composite measure uh, effectively. Um, we need reliable assays with rapid turnaround time in order to help uh, real-time decision-making within the context of a single or multiple ascending dose study. We need to get, gather much more data about how these biomarkers will look like in chronic kidney disease patients. Like I said, so far the work has been focused on healthy volunteers and patients with normal renal function. We also need to have more data which allows us to distinguish between a functional change in a biomarker versus an injury response of that same biomarker. So function versus injury is an important distinguishing feature which can only be realized with more, more data. We also need to understand the biomarkers that we have are focusing on renal tubular injury, which is one of many types of different types of kidney injury. We need to understand how these biomarkers react in other types of kidney injury and whether they're also useful for other types of toxicity. And we need to also establish time course of biomarker patterns of an acute versus a more chronic uh, type of kidney injury. Um, whether the drug is giving toxicity on, on a single dose, like for example, the chemotherapy agent cisplatin versus a long-term administration, like for example, tenofovir or immunoglycoside or other uh, antibiotics um, and the need for more and more and more clinical data. Next slide, please. And what about those biomarkers which are as yet unqualified? Well, all the previous challenges um, on the previous slide will apply. Um, but you have got a new set of challenges which come, creep in now. So what threshold do you use with these biomarkers to interpret an injury response? If you don't have a qualification package, you may not have enough data to know what fold change from baseline would be clinically meaningful and therefore represent an injury response. How to interpret modest changes when you've only used one or two biomarkers in your clinical study, you don't have a full panel to interpret, you might only have one or two biomarkers worth of data. And perhaps the problem that we'll have more of an answer to by the end of these two days is how do we, the industry and academia, collect more uh, sufficient data in order to get acceptance of these biomarkers in the wider communities. Next slide, please. 
And this is my take on where we're going next. I think the, the first port of call is to, to establish uh, the biomarkers that we're currently working on, on qualifying to establish their performance in chronic kidney disease patients. We also need to develop biomarkers for other nephron regions or types of renal injury, for example, glomerular injury um, or tubular interstitial nephritis, which are two very important types of uh, kidney injury. We could also, um, and I can't remember who, who mentioned this already, but we can also consider using these biomarkers, the same biomarkers, as biomarkers of the disease as efficacy endpoints if you're developing drugs which might limit the, the, the degree of AKI in cardiovascular surgery or, or post-trauma, post-sepsis. Um, and you can use, hopefully, the ultimate aim will be to get these biomarkers used in clinical practice so you can monitor and diagnose drug-induced kidney injury and be able to uh, provide the early detection and treatment of AKI as well. Next slide. And I think that was me. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for listening and back to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Stefan. Our, our next presentation is by Dr. Stephen Piccoli. Um, Dr. Piccoli is, uh, joined the Sun Pharma Advanced Research Center as the head of clinical biomarkers in April 2020. I've previously been at GlaxoSmith Klein, where he was the head of clinical biomarkers and the senior director of precision medicine. He's a, a recognized expert in, in clinical biomarkers and precision medicine with extensive contributions to in vitro diagnostics and clinical chemistry and is going to talk on um, developing, validating, qualifying novel biomarkers in clinical trials. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here with so many people who are dedicated to helping solve a critical medical issue. And being late in the series of speakers, I will get to lightly touch on things that have already been mentioned. But unlike my good friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Friedman, I'm not afraid to show you the slide that's up on the screen right now. This is the overall timeline of the safety project, which culminated in the data that Dr. Sultana had described and the outcome of it. But it's important to show that this is a long process um, to get to six biomarkers that we can actually use in the clinic with some meaning. Next, please. So the definitions, we have a lot of different kinds of biomarkers and I don't mean to go into the characteristics of each, but this is just a measure of the complexity of what we have to do to bring a test to the marketplace, to the clinical um, uh, arena where it can be used for a patient. There are a lot of different ways to approach a problem and a lot of different meanings uh, from the data that we generate. Next, please. Well, since the biomarkers may vary, so may the regulatory pathways that go with them. Now we're only three slides deep into the presentation and you've already seen that there are a myriad kind of biomarkers and a myriad kind of measurements that we can make on biomolecules to give us information about this. So it is only fitting, next please, that we have a number of different ways to do this. You've seen part of this slide already, but there are a few things on here that do bear repetition. Exploratory, these are what are known as research use only biomarkers, internal decision-making, not for regulatory review or submission or patient care. We go to the drug approval process next. These are investigational use only. Um, this is where we generate data for regulatory submissions and 510Ks and PMAs and companion diagnostics. Scientific community consensus were mentioned before. This is not a regulatory category, but this is how many things can be done in medical practice. And the last is the biomarker qualification program, which is a formal endorsement and acceptance, but it's not an approval. And we can put biomarkers through any one of these, depending on what its final context of use is, to be able to use to give us information. Next, please. 
So a little more detail here, and this is necessary to give the overview to the project, the RUO Exploratory. There are no formal regulatory requirements. This is not used for patient testing and reporting. It may be used by anyone, anywhere, unrestricted access to the test. But this is not how we generate necessarily high quality data. These are the states that we start asking questions and testing hypotheses and seeing what we can do in the future. So we have to get beyond exploratory uh, to be able to earn the trust and support of people like Marla and, and Becca to be able to help the patients. Um, so we move on to the next there at, at clinical trials. The alphabet soup that follows that is really a morass of the regulatory uh, arenas that apply to different parts of this. There are different requirements for different purposes, but these are the patient testing ones. Um, these are used by medical professionals at a single site. They're highly restricted in their access to both the patient and the clinician. Then we go to the FDA regulated submissions, the 510K, the PMAs and companion diagnostic. There are strict requirements for specific purposes. And these are again used for patient testing, but these can be widely distributed. So there's a whole variety of different ways to bring patient testing to the market. And the problem is, as has been described before in, the, in this series, in this workshop, we need to know the end game before we get there, before we start in order to do this effectively. Next, please. So here's our qualification definition. We qualify these half dozen biomarkers. So a qualification is a conclusion that within the stated context of use, the biomarker can be relied upon to have a specific interpretation and application in drug development and regulatory review. That's very important. It's also critical that this is acknowledged by the FDA, the EMA, and the PMDA. So this applies, every, well, many places in the world. Next, please. Uh, this is just a little bit more detail on the qualification process. Um, it is regulatory certainty. It implies that there can be potential use to this. Uh, the information generated in this process, in our case in particular, is publicly available. Not all information in drug development submissions is publicly available. The decision was made at the beginning of this to have this available for everybody to see how this process was done and these biomarkers were qualified. So this is the formal acceptance of the six panel of six biomarkers by the FDA for use in drug development. It does not designate that the biomarkers are acceptable in clinical practice or as an IVD but does strongly imply that they may get to that point eventually. Next, please. So why does one need these? Um, in drug development process, there are a lot of different uses for biomarkers and we need to adapt what we're doing to the end use, the context of use. Why do we qualify them? We need to make biomarkers that are able to be used across multiple drug development programs without having a formal clinical diagnostic, an in vitro diagnostic device um, as approved by the FDA, which is a lot of more work and may not meet the needs of the particular program. Qualified biomarkers are pretty rare and it's an amazing feat to have had six qualified at once. Next, please. So here are the considerations for the context of use. And just to go through this quickly, it, is, it needs to be complete. It needs to tell you everything it is about what you're going to do, how you're going to use these biomarkers, where you're going to use them. And it helps you establish the performance criteria that you need to generate the data to get you there. It can be modified throughout the process of development and from the timeline you saw, there's certainly enough time to do that. And it's an iterative process. We generate data, we can go back and modify the COU and then generate more data appropriate to that context of use. Next, please. 
So this is just simply to show you that the context of use, the thing that is last, but you need to develop first, drives the other parts of building an assay to generate patient data. And you need to understand the context first, and then go on to do your analytical and clinical parts of the study. Next, please. So how do we define all of this? And without getting into too much detail, we start with our analytical validity, which is measurement of biomarkers in an ideal test system. Scientists can do this pretty nicely. We're good at this. The next is clinical validity, which is measurement in a non-ideal test system, but biologically relevant. We call this the patient. That's a little more difficult, but that still has not yet linked us to the disease that we're interested in. Um, the last one was clinical validation, which is the relationship to it. So here we have, what are the questions we need to ask in terms of how we build an assay to be able to relate the clinical outcome to the analysis of the biomarker. Next, please. You've seen this already. The important part is on the right-hand side, the evidentiary criteria. This is what information do we need to develop to give us confidence that we can relate the clinical outcome to the measurement of the biomarker. Not as easy as it sounds. Next, please. Um, this has already been alluded to, and this is really just the process of doing this. Can we generate the correct information to answer all the questions to fully support the context of use to have a qualified biomarker? And in this case, it was yes. Next, please. How good does the test need to be? There are a lot of things detailed here, some regulatory, some public, some professional agencies, all of which can play into what we have to do to really make everything we're doing robust and support an accurate and safe patient assessment with the biomarkers of interest. Next, please. The assay has to discriminate changes. We call this fit for purpose. And that is something that says we can measure biomarkers that discriminates between changes that are statistically significantly different from the intra and inter subject variation associated with the biomarker. If we measure something um, in myself, it's different than in someone else. That doesn't make it wrong, it makes it different. So how can we build up enough information to say, we know that this change is normal to a person or normal to a population or is clinically significant in measuring a disease or an outcome. So this is the desired measurable change versus the physiological variability. Next, please. There are a lot of different ways to push biomarkers into use in drug development. What you can see here, you may have a pretty good idea of how these are used. Um, we are limited in, in this to safety biomarkers for kidney injury, but there are a large number of others that are possible and are also used in other programs. Next, please. This all began from an analytical standpoint at a public workshop, which was put on by the Critical Path uh, PSTC and the Duke Margolis Institute in 2017. It resulted in a white paper, um, which created alignment on the evidentiary considerations for performing validations of biomarker assays. Next, please. And I put this only up to show something that you can barely see in the lower left-hand corner of the paragraph there. Um, there are representatives on this paper from half a dozen major pharmaceutical companies, various professional organizations, and more importantly, a large number of FDA contributors and authors to the paper. And that gives this really a roadmap to how to do this correctly and what the agency wants to see. So this document provides scientific insight 
into how to address these problems to generate robust usable data. It's not a checklist. It requires people do some thinking about what their context of use is and what generating data means in terms of corresponding to the clinical outcome. Next, please. So how good does a test need to be? It needs to be good enough to fully support it. That's not a check the box statement, but it means that we actually have to work very hard to make sure that this is reliable for a physician to make a decision uh, for a patient. Next, please. So you've heard a little bit about the kidney safety biomarkers so far. Panel of six, we characterize the performance, provided stability data, and generated a lot of analytical information. Now, how can this be used in clinical practice to benefit patients? Dr. Sultana showed a large number of, of outcomes from this, but let's go on here, and I'm going to look at it from a slightly different viewpoint. Next, please. So this is the kidney injury continuum, and lest anyone object, these are not the real colors, but this is simply to show that as one progresses from normal to death of the kidney on the right, um, is that there is a continuum of states. And at the moment, we can't measure or we could not measure before we have extreme kidney failure. And I won't go into any more detail about that, but on the next slide, you can see this from a little bit different biological perspective where you look at the kidney tissue at the top, you see normal going to damage, going to cell death. And underneath the cell death panel, you see delayed biomarkers for kidney injury, serum creatinine and blood urea and nitrogen. These are too late. This is why the box of potential urinary biomarkers for early diagnosis of AKI is important because we can measure these earlier in the damage process before irreparable damage and cell death has occurred. Next, please. So here is our context of use for the uh, safety biomarkers panels. Qualified renal safety biomarkers are proposed to be used together with conventional kidney biomarker monitoring, serum creatinine, BUN, in early clinical drug development research under an IND or CTA to support conclusions as to whether a drug is likely or unlikely to have caused a mild injury response in the renal tubule at the tested dose and duration. This is for use in healthy volunteers and patients with normal renal function, taking into account age and gender. So this pretty much is taking care of the who, what, where, when, and why um, of building assays and generating biomarker data, but it leaves out the last interrogative pronoun. Next, please. And that is, how do we do this? This is a page from our submission to the FDA. This is fondly known as the blue table. This is all the analytical data that has been generated um, for these biomarkers. You can see the names across the top, the manufacturers, the instrumentation, the analytical values we obtain. And I would just like to state that this is one page out of, I believe, 1,573 um, that accompanied this uh, for the submission. So we feel fairly confident that we have justified every point that we have made in having these biomarkers qualified. But that's a measure of the amount of work that it takes to do this. Next, please. So I have mentioned before that this is an iterative process. And you can see here, when you want to have a therapeutic inf intervention, you need to know what effects are being measured or not being measured by your biomarker to get to your clinical endpoint. The clinical endpoint will reflect back to your measurements and show how well it is substituting for that clinical endpoint. And if you do this enough times, you can actually get a very good predictive value for the biomarker to your clinical endpoint. And this is really where we wanted to go with these kidney safety biomarkers. Next, please. So the outcome of all this, um, you've heard a bunch of this before. We had global qualification of seven biomarkers 
as non-clinical biomarkers, animal studies. Um, finally, six individual novel biomarkers qualified for use in suspected AKI with a limited COU in humans. Um, there is a complex measure, a multiplex of six novel biomarkers for an extended COU in AKI. All of the information and utility for this is publicly available. And this is a large step forward in safeguarding patients from drug-induced kidney injury. Um, one thing I would like to say, even though I had measured, I've mentioned a number of different ways that these things can actually be brought to market in, in medical practice, is that as an outcome of this, uh, at least one company has put together a panel of four of these six uh, kidney biomarkers, which can be used routinely now, um, are not FDA approved, but can be used as a CLIA-based laboratory test and are available to the general medical public um, to test patients. And that's a big step forward because that has moved these from the research arena to something that is a lot closer to patient care. So in a short summary, next please. I would just like to uh, refer to uh, a famous Canadian physician, Sir William Osler and his quote of, we're here to add what we can add to life, not to get what we can from life. This is our add to life. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, um, for an excellent presentation, an overview around uh, biomarker development, validation, and, and where it fits into the spectrum of, uh, of biomarker implementation and acceptance. Um, and as, as a reminder, um, during this panel discussion, the, the audience lines are, are muted. You may ask questions via the chat feature. Um, you'll see that in the black bar across the bottom of this screen, this window. And the, the workshop, as you just heard, this is being recorded and it will be made available after the event at cpath.org. So I invite the, um, the panelists to join me now on, on video. Right. Thank you, everyone, for your, your presentations and recordings today. Um, they, were, they were quite insightful, and um, I think they are setting us up for some, some very nice discussion throughout um, today's, today's panel session. Um, I'd, I'd like to open up with, with a, what, a few questions that I received beforehand. Um, so, so first, um, this is directed to those in... Uh, so. Yeah, how how does the pharmaceutical how do pharmaceutical companies utilize input from patients with kidney kidney disease when planning a, a drug development program? And perhaps uh, Gary, if you'd like to lead off here, I know that you you've done some work in this area in terms of, of looking at patient input. Uh, thank thank you, Nick. Uh, glad to respond. Um, so within uh, within our organization, so within Pfizer, in order to approach uh, a governance board with a, uh, a new protocol, uh, we're required to first have an engagement with stakeholders, uh, namely patients. So we have to meet with patients uh, and patient advocates, um, usually in the realm of anywhere between 20 and 40 individuals. Uh, where we have to gain their insights into the disease state, uh, the proposed core protocol elements, and then and only then can we then incorporate that into a draft protocol and present that then to an internal governance board for approval. Honor Frank, is there anything from your perspective and Vishal that you'd like to add with, uh, with your experience? So maybe I, can, I, can... I go unmute, <laughs> Stefan, first me. Uh, so basically, um, it depends on the disease area, we also have to say. It, in some cases, it's easier 
uh, these are disease areas where you know you have nephrotoxicity by default. Let's take transplantation. And exactly the story Becker told us. It's transplantation, there's no regimen out there which is not nephrotoxic. In this case, it's easier to bring a drug forward uh, which is nephrotoxic. Even that you know it's nephrotoxic, it's always a balance between uh, benefit and risk versus uh, you go for a completely different area like pain. Uh, uh, in pain, uh, you as soon as you have a nephrotoxic uh, issue, you have a big problem. But maybe Stefan can elude uh, more on this. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Actually, I, I I I was interpreting the question as being perhaps more from a chronic kidney disease patient, as in participation in clinical studies to alleviate chronic kidney disease. You bring an interesting dynamic, Frank, which is that the patient might want to participate in a study to understand more about drug-induced kidney injury and how to, to monitor for and, and alleviate that. Um, I think your points are, are very relevant, Frank, but it's, it's difficult to, to anticipate when this uh, drug-induced kidney injury might occur. Very similar to what Gary said, my experience is that if you're going into a patient, a new patient indication, especially a new indication for that particular company, we put together a focus group, we, we get a wide variety of opinion from that focus group of patients with the, with the relevant disease that you're interested in. And then you, you try out some, some trial designs to see how acceptable it would be for a participating uh, subject in that study. Yeah, and Frank, just following on what Stefan said in follow-up to you, so included in the core protocol elements are potential signals of safety. So if we have, uh, we classify them either as non-low versus all others. So mm -hmm. if there's non-low, we give them an idea of what the, uh, the restrictions are in terms of baseline EGFR. If there's anything other than none slash low, uh, then they're in the high risk category and we let them know that potential risk. And then we try to give them as much benefit risk information as is digestible in that exactly. focus. So I know Novartis has been, for example, uh, I'm, I used to be part of Novartis in the past. So we, I know we had a lot of issues in transplantation because there's no transplantation drug, which is kidney safe, I would call it. Uh, all have uh, certain limitations on kidney uh, safety injury. And there's, um, I know there's a lot of more tolerance to bring a drug forward. Uh, also with the new biomarkers. So in these areas, the new biomarkers are the most important biomarkers versus I would go, let's say for a pain drug uh, where we know there are drugs out there which have been approved. Benefit risk ratio, if you have a kidney issue uh, would not be favorable. Maybe, um, I. So I, I'm, I'm coming out of the extreme area, transplantation, where you have really, there's no transplantation regimen uh, to treatment available, which is not to some extent nephrotoxic. Yeah, I will add one more point, Nick, if I, can you hear me okay? Yes, definitely, which actually I was going to ask you next, Michelle, in terms of you're looking at, at patient stratification and, and precision medicine now at, at Pfizer. Yeah, well, there is also this big component of science. So it doesn't usually come as a surprise, meaning there is a lot of non-clinical data that is mechanistic information of the drug, the molecule, that goes into risk stratification and ahead of time knowing what is the risk here. And that plays a big role into putting the protocol, as Gary mentioned, together. And also for the clinical safety risk leads to look at it if there is a signal that is identified. So there is a lot of science that happens too, and we know that, therefore we can, uh, we can implement it faster. From a risk stratification perspective, absolutely. Uh, as as uh, Stefan mentioned, whenever companies want to go into a rare, let's say rare kidney disease area, there will be a patient advocacy call 
will all come, they will present their perspective. We'll also get some mechanistic information on what are the real challenges here. And then that influences companies to go into their area and engage, keep engaging with the patient. So we learn through the process. Yeah, and and uh, and Fisha, just building on what you were just saying, you know, within um, the area of transplantation, and this is something that clinically, you know, is near and dear to so many of us. Uh, I, for me, I before coming over to pharma, I was a uh, clinical transplant nephrologist, and and there we really uh, uh, engaged with patients and their families on a one-to-one -one basis as we got ready for transplantation, whether it was living donor or non-living donor transplantation. And then we also engage with uh, patient advocacy groups because patients are very well informed in transplantation about potential risks of nephrotoxicity or malignancy or infection. So a very, very uh, informed group that gives us very meaningful feedback. So lots of, uh, Frank, I think that was a great example uh, to bring forward um, because it is a challenging area, but yes, Novartis in particular has done an outstanding job of bringing transplant medications uh, into, uh, into the real world. So one thing I would like to ask the panelists. So basically my real world example too, it was a drug, it was not uh, foreseen that we had against uh, what Vishal just said. It was not foreseen that it increases serum creatinine. So we had a drug, phase two, uh, we had 25% uh, of increases immediately upon treatment. We had a immediate uh, reduction of the serum creatinine when we stopped the treatment. But it was a drug uh, first in class, um, and we didn't know how to deal with it. And that's something um, where I say that's not a it was not a class of drugs where we considered a general kidney injury. So basically, it was a drug where we said, okay, how can we bring it forward to patients? Because uh, phase one again, fifteen percent of patients. You miss it in phase one, honestly. Maybe one patient had an increase, whatever. But in phase two, we were really doomed at the moment when we had the 25% increase. We were very happy after 25% decrease uh, after cessation of the drug, but we could not prove it's only a PK issue. That's something uh, I think which can happen every drug developer in every area. And there I would like to hear uh, basically Gary's and Stefan's ideas uh, because uh, it was a difficult situation. Yeah, uh, Frank, I'll, I'll take a, a first stab at it. First of all, uh, you know, with um, we try to stay given the revolution that's happening now in nephrology and testing, we tried to stay ahead of the uh, of the curve. So the first thing we would look at would be we would make sure that we did have a serum cystatin C, and we do yeah. have have that reflex now, so we can do that immediately, get that as rapidly as we can get stat serum creatinine. And if we saw the same rise in serum cystatin C, we would be similarly worried. If we did not, we <laughs> would then be looking at the biomarker panel. Uh, and we have really uh, taken uh, the data from the learnings to date on the biomarker panel. And uh, I don't want to steal any thunder from Vijal, but uh, we are developing great faith in this panel. But and, if we, and if we saw both- Let's, let's have one more response here on, on this question. And then if you don't mind, if we move on. We've got a few questions from the audience right now. But go ahead, Stefan, and we'll move on to the next question. No, it's okay. I was just I echo what Gary said um, in that you you need to differentiate between a serum creatinine pharmacology effect versus a renal blood flow effect versus a renal injury effect, and there are various tests that you can just tease out the the, the difference between those three. Injury biomarkers are one of those uh, tools that you can use. 
So the, the first question from the audience I'm going to, um, going to bring up is um, from, from Richard Knight. And, and he asks um, if it's important to focus, um, he thinks it's important to focus on biomarkers that are diagnostic and predictive. And, and so the question, do we currently have any biomarkers that address these two areas with, uh, with sufficient accuracy? And, and um, Dr. Himmel Farbaugh, I'll, I'll direct the uh, first response to you. I think that some of your pre presentation and discussing around this topic. Yeah, so, you know, I think the kidney is a challenge compared to a number of other organs because of the multiplicity of mechanisms and parts of the kidney and compartments that can be injured in different ways. And so uh, there's never going to be a one size fits all biomarker that will tell you uh, both for a class of, you know, from a class effect. Uh, you know, it will always go up with a certain drug that's nephrotoxic uh, or um, probably uh, predictive for individuals entirely. Um, you really have to take each use case, each mechanism by which the drug is active, mechanism uh, active in the kidney and also how it's potentially eliminated by the kidney. Uh, is it a substrate for a basolateral transport? Is it just filtered? You know, is it a vascular potential injury? Is it a tubular potential injury, glomerular potential injury? So I think it's, you know, the kidney is very complex that way. Um, you know, the example I gave of tenofovir. So if you look at a, a thousand, like Dr. Sleepback has published, if you look at a thousand patients that get tenofovir and you measure a panel of biomarkers before and after you give the drug, uh, the biomarkers go up by like 5%, uh, very modestly, 5, 10, you know, maybe a couple of them maybe have a slightly uh, higher rate of change. That's a class effect, if you will, across the thousand patients that get tenofovir that tells you okay, there might be, some, you know, maybe we should pay attention to nofibir from a nephrotoxicity standpoint. Do we know that the, there's a strong correlation between in, in individual response, biomarker response, uh, and uh, the likelihood of nephrotoxicity? For some drugs, probably yes. For other drugs, probably no. So, you know, I don't think this is simple. I don't think that we're going to have a panel of three or five or six biomarkers I, I that in every single case is going to tell us what's going on in terms of both for the individual and for a class effect, the risk for nephrotoxicity. I completely agree with you, Steve. Uh, so basically, uh, you would never classify those as drug-induced kidney injury if you say about 5% increase. You would never. Right. And it looks like, um, Elisa, you have your hand raised right now. I think you've got a, a comment as well. Well, and, uh, and you know, I think R Richard's asking a, 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 a great question, you know, about these biomarkers and are any really ready for prime time. And I think, you know, one of the things we need to consider, and, you know, I, I can't speak to clinical practice, but certainly, you know, whenever we think about, um, you know, drug development and looking at data in, in that context, you know, there's really no decision that we arrive at that's based on a single biomarker. Um, really, what we do is we use a, uh, a large body of you know, different biomarkers, clinical findings, et cetera, that uh, you know, give us a sense or give us a, a level of suspicion that uh, you know, there could have been injury to the kidney. So I did want to highlight that when we think about these new biomarkers coming forward, it's not that they need to tell us everything, um, but, but we do need to understand how they can help us inform decision making, um, you know, what, uh, you know, what settings are likely to be informative in, in other settings, you know, where they may um, mislead us. I think what we really need to do is just, you know, really understand you know, a lot of characteristics about them. It's like creatinine. Creatinine has right. a lot of limitations, but it still has tremendous utility. If I can say one more thing, I think we need to distinguish. There are some drugs that we know if you give enough of it to every single person, they're going to be nephrotoxic. Uh, it's just the nature of the risk-benefit ratio then that determines the dosing and the indication. 
There are other drugs where it's idiosyncratic, where whether it's genetic susceptibility, whether it's co-administration with another drug, whether it's some comorbidity or it's luck of the draw. Uh, there, uh, you know, it might be one in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000 people are affected, but they can be severely affected. And that's going to be very difficult to detect in phase one or phase two trials. I mean, no matter what panel uh, we have. So each, each case, each use case, I think, is very different in terms of how we have to think about it. Yeah, and Jonathan, just to add, the other word in that question, which is a loaded word, is predictive. Yeah. And in, in the sense that can the biomarkers tell us ahead of time if, they, if the intervention is going to work or not and how effective is the intervention? And I feel that is where we should put our money into also, apart from thinking on safety. And we are yet to see a good example of these biomarkers or more or any uh, useful for predictiveness in AKI population. Matthias, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, responding, responding to Alisa's comment, <clears throat> obviously we don't want to have a biomarker which is capturing all signals across everything. I think the power of the panel we already have right now and hopefully with our increased understanding of nephron segment functionality is that which biomarker responds where and when already pinpoints to the smoking gun of the mechanism of drug toxicity. And I think that's one of the main areas that drug-induced kidney injury is not a singular homogeneous disease slash event. It obviously gives us a mixture of different pathobiologies present in the kidney. And as we are mapping the landscape of injury in the kidney at molecular granularity, utilizing the current biomarker, which are qualified, and testing them across the emerging molecular understanding on the cellular level of the kidney, will be a big step forward, which I think we can do as a community. And then at the same time, using the emerging cell level understanding molecular of kidney failure uh, to identify where the current panel has blind spots and fill those blind spots as we go forward. Uh, Nick, Nick yes. again, just one last point. You know, that, that word predictive uh, prediction, that really is, you know, obviously uh, it, it means different things to a biostatistician than it does to a human being with a well-functioning allograph. Um, and the reality is, is that, you know, um, having kidney failure gives you a certain amount of PTSD. Um, you carry that even when you have a well-functioning allograft, you remember back to when you got bad news. Uh, and so our goal is to be able to appropriately gather all the data as much as we can across the full age spectrum, every ethnicity, every, every race, uh, every baseline GFR, and then be able to give people a, uh, a true reading, and, and I know I'm saying that in quotes, of what a movement in one or two or all six of those biomarkers means in comparison to a stable creatinine. Um, we want to be able to give people a useful tool for themselves, but additionally for their clinicians so that people can predict more reliably what's going on quietly below the surface of Joe Bonaventure's uh, very nice iceberg picture that he showed. But uh, that means, Gary, that you want to bring forward the prospective clinical trials again. And I think uh, the prospective clinical trials, we need to think about uh, other ways of collecting more data. Yeah, more Frank, agreed 100%. Okay. And, and we agree with your Bayesian approach much more. Okay. Okay. Well, we have uh, in another pair of questions on from from our audience are is is looking at um, animal models and um, and initial assessment of the biomarkers. So, so the first question is is asking you know in, in the case where where the, there may not be sufficient animal models for um, uh, drug induced kidney injury for specific types of of, of injury um, such as uh, interstitial nephritis. 
um, what's the value of, of utilizing atom models first and um, and humans versus only in humans before being useful um, in, in the clinic? It's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> it is a difficult uh, question, definitely. Uh, so okay. basically, I take the first route. Uh, so basically, um, what we learned is uh, animal models are pretty good in predicting kidney injury. If you don't have that, uh, you're doomed. I tell it really doomed because then you need to manage kidney safety in human immediately. Uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, luckily, what I've seen in contrast to other injuries, drug induced organ injuries, uh, kidney is very much predictable from let's say animal studies usually. I presented a case, which was not the case, but that was uh, at the end, uh, it was a pharmacologic event. So basically uh, we had a false positive 25% increase of uh, serum carotenine, which was a pharmacologic event blocking uh, the resorption of creatinine through the kidney. Um, things like that can happen, but overall I would say uh, in, if it's real kidney injury, it's 90% predictable by talk studies. But uh, again, uh, Stefan uh, will have other ideas, Gary, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I would just I would just clarify one point though. Even if you don't have a um, a specific animal model of the toxicity, I think the animal models that tell you about what the biomarkers mean uh, can actually be very informative. Uh, and so you're learning from the animal models, even if you don't have because you know you know what what different things what NGAL going up means, uh, or one of two things that it might mean in the kidney. And so when you see that in humans, at least we, we seem to have a, an ability then to interpret the, or when you see clustering go up, mm -hmm. and you can see, um, you know, you, you get a, a rationale for the, for the uh, human uh, problem. I completely agree with Stro. So I was a bit more on the negative side. <laughs> you really don't have uh, a signal in animals, mm -hmm. but uh, let's go forward. Thanks, Stro. Yeah, and, and, then, and the next and the next question regarding uh, animal studies, I'll, I'll I'll take a first response on this and then put it to the team to, to the panel. Um, you know, is, is how consistently are standardized and comprehensive. Um, studies done in animal in toxicology, animal toxicology studies and, and paired with histology um, in order to look at, at translational application. And, and I'll say in the case of, of TSTC and, and our biomarkers, um, we initiated the work in, um, in rat studies uh, where we did have, um, we, we put together a standard a lexicon and assessment for the histology so that across companies and across studies, we could um, have the same rating scale for um, histological injury and then compare that to changes in the biomarkers. And so that's been, for, for PSDC's translational approach, it's, it's pivotal um, and crucial to advancing most biomarkers if it's something that we can detect and monitor um, in, in an animal model initially to provide uh, an idea of what types of, of injury are occurring at the cellular and and, and, and make her level within the animal's kidneys. Um, additional comments from, from the panel? Nick, maybe I can just quickly uh, chime in and, and I'm sure Joe and Jonathan will elaborate on this, which is apart from animal models, we're also missing this key kidney on a chip or kidney mm -hmm. organoids that will fill mm -hmm. that gap, which is 90%, according to Frank, are covered by animal models. What about the next 10%? Well. If you do identify a 15% signal in first in human, can you quickly go back to this organoids or kidney on a chip to understand hmm, is it, what is the mechanism here? And is it going to be even more profound when we go to disease state, right? Because we don't understand what 
the drugs will do in disease population in terms of safety concerns as much as we do or as much as the animal models tell us in the healthy volunteer. And so that gap potentially can be filled by these, these kidney organoids and kidney on a chip, which are advancing. And there is a hope there that in the next three to five years, they will fill that gap, but we'll have to see. Yeah, I think, I think with, the, with kidney on a chip technology, you know, we, we're, it's maturing to a point where we can begin to ask some of the questions that are difficult to answer with some of the animal models and, and begin to probe into disease specific areas in a manner that's not necessarily, that, that has too many caveats um, with, with some of the animal models when you look at, at disease, um, at animal disease models. Jonathan, I think, I think you had a response here as well. Yeah, I could respond. We've been working for 10 years now in the kidney on a chip field and also in the, and Joe as well in the kidney organoid field, both of us are uh, similarly involved. I think these systems are increasingly recognized as giving reliable signals and they are translational. When there is a concern about whether um, you're the, there's a species nephrotoxicity difference or not between the various animal models and humans in either direction, where something's toxic in an animal model and not in humans. Those are harder to prove because usually drugs don't get to humans if they're toxic positive in the animal model. But the fidelity, you know, I think <laughs> we're showing uh, that there is good fidelity. Also that you can deploy the same biomarkers in these chips, in the effluent, uh, we, we've shown multiple times now, you know, when Kim one goes up uh, in a chip, it's probably going up in a person as well. You know, the, the data correlate very nicely. So you can actually translate even with the biomarkers into chips. Organoids a little bit more complex because they're not perfused luminally or vascularly in the same way. Uh, as uh, human kidneys are for the for the biomarker piece, but there's some utility for the biomarkers even being deployed there. The real advantage, I think, of the um, kidney on a chip models and organoid models are twofold. Uh, one is they're really high, they give you high content information about mechanisms of injury uh, by cell type specificity. And the other is that you can really understand how genetic variation contributes to injury because you can use CRISPR-like technologies now to adjust or just pick the genetic background of the cell type that you're using. Uh, so those are two advantages that are very, I think, um, hard to just rely on animal models, healthy, young, genetically identical animals all on the same diet. Um, you know, you can, uh, there's some limitations clearly to the animal models that you can um, adjust for. So I think they're added there, you know, it's value added. They're more high content than high throughput and probably always will be more high content than high throughput. Okay. Information. So now I put something else up. Um, thinking about Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca who presented herself as a transplantation person uh, with transplantation drugs being nephrotoxic by default. Uh, can we have something in between uh, that we uh, manage our patients uh, and we manage our nephrotoxicity in the meantime before going to crazy research? Sorry, <laughs> John. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm putting this out now, but uh, I think also about our patients. How can we manage our patients? Uh, with current markers, uh, established markers, uh, knowledge of what we need to do for patient management before going crazy. And so cy cyclosporin is an interesting example to talk about here because cyclosporin in the animal model work before its approval was not particularly nephrotoxic at all. And it's still hard to make a good animal model of cyclosporin nephrotoxicity. You have to salt deplete the animal. You gotta give way higher doses than you give to nowadays than we give to human beings. Uh, so the, the preclinical evaluation of cyclosporin, which is a life-sustaining drug and you know, wonderful despite its nephrotoxicity, 
we just published an interesting paper from our chip work where we showed that if you use human kidney microvascular endothelial cells as opposed to other types of primary uh, human yeah. cells, the kidney cells are far more susceptible to cyclosporin toxicity than the rest of the vasculature. So how do you figure all that out ahead of time? How do you predict all that? I don't know, uh, but it's a good example of how, you know, we have holes despite the usual paradigm that we have for uh, safety evaluation. There are holes in what we do these days. Exactly. And that's what I wanted to point you to. It's really like uh, sometimes we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. And right. suddenly it, it appears like nephrotoxic and uh, cyclosporin, tacrolimus. Well, in the meantime, we know the mechanism of action of nephrotoxicity. But uh, also we manage our patients on a low level, uh, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, kidney safety, because they get all uh, these drugs and combined with myfortic, with uh, evrolimus and so on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not the ideal case for our patients. Yeah, and I'll just point out something Matthias uh, mentioned and we can probably come back to in this meeting, and that is some of the new tools in studies like the Kidney Precision Medicine Project are giving us more cell molecular and cellular specificity than we had before. Again, this is high content, not, not available in thousands of people type information, but we are going to learn a lot uh, at least on the AKI side, about uh, mechanisms of injury and reparative processes okay. from these really detailed spatial analyses now of transcripts and proteins and metabolites in various genetic backgrounds, et cetera. And I don't know, Matthias, if you want to talk more about it now. I'm sure it's going to come up later on in this meeting. Too. I think we'll have a discussion on that topic tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, yes. perhaps in the interest of time, let's, let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. We've got but about nine minutes left for our, our panel session right now. Um, there, there is one question that's come up. Um, it, uh, it, it's a little bit moving towards uh, um, uh, beyond application for, 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 for drug development, but um, you know, relative, so the question is relative to, to, to the, the qualified biomarkers um, which have been identified to signal drug-induced kidney injury. Um, in the context of clinical practice, what type of education is being offered to primary care physicians about these biomarkers? Um, and are new lab tests being developed to help primary care physicians detect drug-induced kidney injury early on? Um, so this one, I think I'll, I'll, I'll direct to some of our, our academic clinicians right now who are, are maybe uh, closer to, to patients um, in experiencing this. May I, I can just add something um, in that context. There's a long way to, a long ways to go um, on the education front. And what I would start with is something, a biomarker that we know a lot about, and that's urinary albumin, and and um, you know which is reflective of um, of underlying kidney disease. And and it's it's unfortunate that we can't implement the use of that test, which is readily available, um, which would pick up a lot of early disease um, that we're missing right now. So yeah, I, I guess I would, I would try to focus the attention in terms of the primary care community to measuring creatinine, which we have, and measuring urinary albumin in patients. And then, and then we could you know, develop it more when we have more information about the biomarkers. That we're talking about here. I'm, I'm going to accentuate what Joe said. I'm, pessi I'm going to go further. I'm pessimistic about the primary care community. You know, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys and Haynes show that um, up to 90, 80, 90 percent of people with chronic kidney disease are unaware of it, and 50 percent of people with stage four chronic kidney disease are unaware of it. Um, you know, getting primary care docs to, uh, you know, was a big step forward to convert serum creatinines to EGFRs. 
uh, and maybe we'll get cystatin C come into regular clinical practice if the cost goes down and becomes more uh, available, and that might help. Uh, but in the case I presented today, that person had thousand milligrams percent glucose in the urine for like nine years. There was people were measuring it and not reacting to it. Um, you know, so getting the primary uh, care community to really be tuned into AKI biomarkers or, uh, you know, uh, Dickey biomarkers, I think is going to be a challenge. I would be very happy if they recognized chronic kidney disease early and often and uh, dealt with it early and often and informed patients that they had it early and often. And Eliza, uh, I'll pass it to you right now as well. Yeah. Sure, and this is just a, a follow-up comment. You know, figuring out what to do in individual patients, I think, is probably the hardest part of medicine, right? What clinicians have to do from day to day and, you know, um, is incredibly challenging, right? Um, but I, and, and I can understand uh, why, obviously, that, um, you know, what we're hearing is, uh, you know, a fair amount of pessimism about how far we're going to have to go, uh, though, obviously, the community is going to work to go there. But I did want to hopefully just highlight that I think for what we're talking about today, which is using these biomarkers in clinical trials to uh, inform our understanding about the injury and whether there is, in fact, injury to the kidney. Um, I think that there are, uh, there's already a body of evidence, which you've already heard about earlier, um, that really uh, suggests that we can be using these now to inform decision making. These aren't exploratory. Uh, they've advanced beyond that. So I do hope that that message is being clearly um, conveyed. Thanks, Lisa. And, and Marla and Becca, I, I'm, I'm a little bit curious. From your, your work with this, with this working group over the past um, year plus now, in, in speaking with your nephrologists or primary care physicians, um, have you gone back to them and asked questions around um, you know, where they see uh, use of some of these biomarkers for, for assessing your health? Or... Great question, Nicholas. Um, yes, I feel like I, um, I might be a, a different or luckier case um, because I have Alport syndrome and the nephrologist that I work with, I don't think he's on the call, but um, I, he knows my case pretty well. And so the questions that I have, I feel like are not new or novel in particular to what I'm going through. But, you know, when I hear Dr. Himmelfarb talk about <laughs> this potential pessimism, you know, it's really good to hear this because, um, you know, when I hear about the case that he mentioned and many of the experiences that my fellow other patients have endured, um, I know it's in, it's important for us to address these biomarkers early on because I feel like what I have gone through is relatively easy in comparison to many others. So to answer your question, um, yes, I ask questions, but I don't think um, I've received a lot of confusion in that. I, I, I've received pretty direct answers and uh, feel hopeful in terms of my help. So, but thank you. And for me, uh, my doctor is so meticulous about biomarkers. That's what he focuses on mostly. And so I've been paying attention to them for many years from almost day one, because I asked him at the beginning, what's important? And he actually took the time to say, here's what your baseline GFR was, or here's what your baseline creatinine serum was. And here's where you're at now. And here's the safe zone and here, you know. And it was so interesting. But what he does is he measures them every, is it three months or every four months and goes through them. Not one test gets past them without him looking at and discussing with me. I mean, we spend more time talking about my labs than than anything else. I mean, obviously he said the most important thing is how are you feeling? He said, that's more important than anything on that clinically he can look at. But if I say I'm feeling great doc, then he will go biomarker by biomarker and just say, here's where you're at here. He shows me trends. I love trends. And he's taught me not to focus specifically on one lab result that might not be ideal. Like when it gets worse and I started to get depressed, like, oh my God, I'm in the wrong direction. He said, don't do that. 
look at the trend, look at the overall trend over the years. And it brought me peace of mind. So um, I think he's done a fantastic job, Dr. Chiwan Shu at UCSF at um, keeping me informed of biomarkers. And I can, oh, I, I can't figure out how to raise a hand, but uh, <laughs> just to close the loop on education, I think that is, this is also a big component in the Kidney Health Initiative five-year strategy document. It, there is a big emphasis on raising awareness, but also focusing on community efforts about the biomarkers, what do they mean, how to interpret it, and so on. So hopefully things probably will change. Uh, yeah. And, and Stephen, I see, I see that you have your hand raised. I do. And so my question here is, whose job is it to educate the primary care physician? which is very different than the stories we've heard about research nephrologists at advanced academic institutions who will certainly be up on these and be able to use them even as a research setting before these things become accepted as mainstream cl clinical practice. But how does that information get to the people who are most likely to use it in a neighborhood diagnostic setting for the patients who the 90% of whom have disease and don't know it. That's a very difficult problem. Steve? Uh, I should, yeah, Gary, before we move on, I see that Becca has her hand raised. Okay, oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 like after, go ahead. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm like Vishal, you know, we work for the same company. We've never been taught how to raise our hands on, on Zoom. So. Um, but um, Steve, the good news for you is it's not your job. Um, you have enough jobs. But part of, you know, what I was alluding to, and, and I'll, I'll touch on more this afternoon when, in, in my next talk, there needs to be uh, an amalgamation uh between uh, clinicians as well as patients um, where they all have the same information at the same time and then they can go and speak in their respective directions. Having been a practicing physician for almost two decades before coming over to the dark side, I, 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 know, I know what I'm thinking. I know how I'm thinking, but I very often I'm misperceiving, you know, what a patient or their family uh, or somebody else is, is thinking about. And what we need to do, and we'll touch on this with the biomarker data repository, uh, this, I think it's this afternoon. We really do need to have a way to be able to communicate information as real time as is possible. So people have realistic expectations of what is accruing. We're not raising unrealistic expectations. However, at the same time, we're not being so pessimistic that we're not sharing the information as it's beginning to emerge. So it needs to be really multimodal. Uh, it has to come from academicians, it has to come from regulators, has to come from pharma, but it also has to come from patients and patient advocacy groups that have the most up-to-date information. And, well, and yeah, we're here. I, we're I, coming I, to the to the end of this of this um, panel session right now. So I think uh, Becca and Jonathan have their hands raised, and and so we can answer those. And I think we we'll have to move on just in the interest of time. Okay, I'll be really fast. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to echo actually what Dr. Friedman just said. I do think there's a lot of responsibility on patients. However, I do want to acknowledge that um, we know that patients of color are more. You know, uh, they experience kidney disease more often than their counterparts. And so recognizing the inequalities that come with access to education is also why I'm very passionate about what you all do here and very grateful for it. So although I think patients need to ask up and know the right questions to ask their nephrologist, I do also think within the limited time frame that doctors do have with their patients, be able to encourage them to the right resources so that 
you know, we all know knowledge is power so that the patient themselves know what to ask for. They know what to ask for. Well, what does this trend, you know, mean as what Marla was saying? So when I have questions and I ask Dr. Jefferson, he's able to answer me, you know, hey, this is your trend on creatinine, or this is why anemia is something to look out for when you're experiencing kidney failure. Um, so it's really echoing what you all have said, but yes, patients do need a little bit of, I think, guiding to know what questions to ask. And I'll, I'll try and be brief, uh, though I, I express some skepticism about primary care. I want to point out that there are a lot of uh, venues where I think we really can educate uh, physicians with more specificity. You know, I think ICU physicians uh, in terms of AKI and AKI biomarkers are very tuned in. Oncologists that are going to be administering potentially nephrotoxic drugs can be uh, tuned in. Obviously, transplant uh, uh, physicians are already uh, tuned in. So there are more targeted uh, high prevalence uh, of risk for nephrotoxicity uh, clinicians uh, where I do think uh, they will be receptive uh, to uh, new tools that'll give more uh, predictive ability uh, in clinical circumstances. So primary care is a whole different issue. You know, the American College of Physicians has still not recommended kidney disease screening, even by serum creatinine and albumin, as Joe pointed out, for the general population. And there are a whole bunch of issues around false positives. You know, if your pretest probability is low and with biomarkers and you're gonna get some, you know, as many false positives as false negatives. And, you know, so I don't think we should be focusing on primary care docs as much as physicians who are gonna be taking care of patients that have a high risk to experience drug-induced kidney injury. There, I think there is a, it could be a major educational effort that could be beneficial. Exactly, and that's something I, I personally take home, uh, like listening to Marla, uh, listening to uh, issues about kidney transplantation. I've been part of Novartis uh, over many years, and we had always the issue of <coughs> drug-induced kidney injury, but listening uh, to, to a customer makes a lot of more a, a difference for me personally. And I think we should promote this and uh, promote the customer's voice. Well, thank you uh, presenters and panelists for joining us and we will move into our next session right now. We will be leading off with a, a personal perspective um, by, from Glenda Roberts around drug safety and collaboration. So if everyone doesn't mind uh, muting yourself and, and putting your, turning off your video right now, we will have this pre-recorded video up in just a moment. Hi. My name is Glenda Roberts, and I'm the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement at the Kidney Research Institute and the Center for Dialysis Innovation at the University of Washington. But most importantly, I'm a person living with kidney disease, and I am very excited about this initiative that is related to drug-induced kidney injury and data collaboration. You know, when I got my kidney transplant back in 2010, one of the things that I was struck by was the fact that I seemed to be a part of some experiment. I'm sure you've all heard about the large cadre of drugs that transplant recipients are given. But what struck me most was on a regular basis, the pharmacists and the nephrologists would come in and they'd have this worried look and they'd say, well, you, you seem to be having a reaction to this drug or that drug or the interaction of various drugs. And I felt like I was a part of some experiment that nobody really knew how these drugs were likely to act together. And in some cases they would say, well, we're gonna take you off the drug. But in other cases they would say, well, we're gonna reduce the amount of the drug because it's really important at this phase of the transplant. But later they'd come back and say, oh, well, you're still having the reaction. So we're gonna completely eliminate the drug. And that was very disquieting for me as a patient 
because I heard the earlier message that this drug was very important to your kidney health. But now we're going to take you off of it. So I worried that perhaps I wasn't getting the best treatment. And it seemed to me that the healthcare team should have been able to better predict what the likelihood was that these drugs would interact together because they've done a lot of transplants, as well as how I was likely to be impacted personally as a patient. Drug-induced kidney injury is important to me because we know very little about drug-induced kidney injury. And I would like to know that there are more biomarkers than just, say, creatinine that might be used to signal early injury so that we could possibly prevent further damage to the kidneys or prevent damage at all. I would like for the research community to know that patients are concerned about drug-induced kidney injury, and we would like to have more data sharing and collaboration between the members of industry. I am personally very excited to have the opportunity as a patient to participate in this workshop because it gives me an opportunity to collaborate with all of the other stakeholders, whether we're talking about members of the pharmaceutical industry, academic research, regulators, and other patients. Because I think that by sharing our common experiences and our common concerns, we can identify what we need to do to take this process to the next level. I hope to see more activity following this workshop and that we will be able to collaborate and work together to create the kinds of tools that are necessary to develop novel treatments and therapies and identify new biomarkers. And I am particularly grateful to be able to contribute because I know that frequently in a competitive environment, big players are not comfortable coming together. And I want to emphasize how much I appreciate those players who have been willing to sit down at the table and offer their data for use in this collaborative way. And I look forward to continue to being involved with them going forward. And if I had one more ask, it would be to ensure that we provide additional education for clinicians and for patients. We know that often drug-induced injury occurs early on and it's not even identified because there are no tools to help clinicians recognize the occurrence of Dickey earlier. We also know that patients are unaware of what things they might do, like they don't recognize which drugs, NSAIDs, antibiotics, or other things that might contribute to drug-induced injury that they could avoid and possibly avoid being injured themselves. So to the extent that we can have additional education for patients and clinicians, I think it would be a winner. Thank you very much, Glenda, for that, that uh, excellent uh, recording. And so we're going to move to our next talk now. And, and this session is looking at addressing unmet needs. Um, Gary Friedman will be joining us once more for a brief presentation. So Gary, I'll pass it to you right now. Just let uh, Katrina know when to advance the slide. Okay. Nick, uh, first and foremost, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for this second opportunity. And I feel very honored that uh, I get to uh, set the table a little bit before Amita Parikh comes on from FDA. Um, my disclosures you're already familiar with. You can go to the next slide. So um, you remember from uh, my earlier very, very rapid talk about that feeling of being behind the eight ball, that, that incredible uh, arduous push up the hill uh, to really try and develop more and more biomarkers uh, and more prognostication tools uh, as relate to kidney disease. 
you know, we have been gaining a lot of information um, as more and more drugs have been going through the FDA approval process, whether in, in solid organ uh, transplant, including kidney transplant, or just in kidney disease in general, there's been more and more information about various biomarkers that have been part of the approvals uh, for a variety of drugs. So the good news is, um, is that we are although we still feel like we're behind the eight ball, uh, and although we are all still pushing uh, that boulder up the hill, the reality is, is that we are gaining, we are making gains. Uh, and so just last year, uh, this future state uh, has already begun to emerge, you know, with the New England Journal uh, of Medicine publication last November uh, regarding the 2021 CKD epi, uh, formulae you know, utilizing creatinine only or utilizing the combination of serum creatinine and serum cystatin C, that, that to me was uh, uh, an, an opening bell uh, for something that's been getting ready to ring for quite some time. And what I was alluding to earlier is that there is no, uh, no need for uh, a crystal ball as much as there is a need for a large data set that encompasses people of all ages, all levels of kidney function, diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse genetic and ethnic backgrounds. The more data that we have, the more we'll be able to apply um, that crystal ball, which some of us refer to uh, being AI and machine learning. We're going to be able to uh, run more and more larger data sets with high quality data, uh, as, as Steve Piccoli has been alluding to on a number of occasions, as long as we know that the assays are of high quality, reproducible uh, data, then we can begin to prognosticate. Next slide. So it's 2022 and now really, all of the pieces really are in view. So, you know, FDA um, uh, uh, convenes uh, uh, patient-focused drug development for uh, on a regular basis now. Uh, and you just have to go to their website. You'll see, you will eventually see that the disease of interest to you will be coming up uh, in, in a forum. And there, uh, it's an all-day event where uh, FDA patients, scientists, industry, everybody gets together to discuss a specific um, malady from, from, from A to Z. Um, so that piece, um, because of internet access uh, being increasingly broad, more and more people are able to attend those forums. Additionally, um, we know that the, uh, the biomarkers um, that are being worked on, uh, whether uh, on one side of the Atlantic or the other, those data uh, either have or can be entered into this growing biomarker data repository that we abbreviate BMDR. As that grows, as everybody shares more and more data, then you're going to have uh, information about biomarkers at baseline and post baseline, regardless of whether they have normal kidney function or they have uh, kidney function all the way down to the point of needing a transplant or dialysis. So for kidney disease space, we have ways, uh, we have ideas in our minds of how to gather this information, get it into the right hands, and then make that information available. So not only available to patients and their, their nephrologists, but also broadly across the academic nephrology community to really be able to incorporate that data, interrogate it, and then come up with what are the expected values uh, based upon the patient's initial baseline conditions where do we expect the biomarkers to be at that moment versus if they are exposed to a nephrotoxic agent, where do we expect to see those move and how soon? So it really is time to, to really push the envelope. Uh, it's not time to sit back and wonder where, where are we going to find these things? Where are the pieces? Everything is in front of us. So if you go to the next slide, um, it really is uh, beginning with uh, the, the uh, awareness 
uh, whether it is through internet, whether it's through publications, you name it, there is increasing awareness and patients are participating in that uh, increasing level of awareness and driving clinicians to become more and more aware of it. Next slide. And I, I don't know who created this picture, uh, but you know, I, there's something about my brain. It just really thinks it flow diagrams. And here, what we can tell you is in 2022, um, a number of us on this call have been involved in biomarker discovery, uh, learning phase, um, uh, uh, data uh, uh, collection uh, and analysis, uh, and then taking them through to the point of testing these in prospective uh, trials. Uh, there are a number of us from multiple companies that, you know, it's hard sometimes to remember who's with which company because it feels like we communicate every every week so often and we are sharing more and more information in compliant ways through these consortia. Um, the, the FDA, NIH, NIDDK, all of the governmental organizations that have come together to really help create that best biomarker, uh, that best resource for biomarkers and endpoints and safety testing, that is an immense step forward going back over the past four or five years to really guide us uh, in industry how to begin to think in a more rapid fashion. How can we move biomarkers from potential discovery to uh, bring them into uh, a research use situation and then ultimately into an approved status. So academics, uh, you know, nephrologists who are publishing, who are dis making discoveries, doing the basic science work, bringing those awarenesses to whether it's American Society of Kidney Disease or American Society of Transplantation, there is more and more preclinical animal data uh, and then human data that is being shared on a real-time basis at these multiple multiple forums across the globe on a month-by-month -month basis. And then all those data from the left side of this, of this image then will make their way into that uh, data storage uh, so that the data can be then asset, accessed uh, by pharma, by academia, by clinicians, by patients, uh, by consortia, by regulatory agencies, so that if you go to the next slide, you can see that the outputs from that can be guided by examples of systems that, again, already exist. So if you start in the upper left-hand corner uh, in clinical trial endpoints, I already mentioned about the best resource from the FDA and NIH. Uh, within pharma, uh, we utilize data standards and CDISC uh, metadata standards. Uh, we use metric coding, ICD-10 coding, uh, and then we use common uh, uh, protocol templates so that we're already working in increasingly constrained fashion, not constrained in a bad sense, but in a positive sense that we're collecting information in a more homogeneous fashion. And then we're looking to academics, and you see in the center of this from the song uh, glomerular disease group, which uh, you can see the reference at the bottom there. This is a consortium of dozens upon dozens upon dozens of experts in the field of nephrology that help to define what are the data points that we need for primary, secondary, tertiary analyses. And when you flow from that upper left-hand corner using systems that we already have, you further inform them based upon information coming from groups of academics with very, very strong focus on data development. You then see on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, there can be standardized reporting. We can use precedented clinical outcome measures, whether they're uh, completed by patients or by uh, clinicians. Uh, and then you can look at standard biomarkers. We, we don't get rid of that information. The standard biomarkers like creatinine, uh, serum cystatin C, EGFR, uh, proteinuria, albuminuria, these are all very, very relevant 
bit parts of the bigger picture. But now we can begin to, with that biomarker data repository, collecting all of the standard information and now collecting the novel information, we can begin to make conjectures and then re-interrogate on a periodic basis. And going to the next slide, I'll show you what I mean. So as these data come into the biomarker data repository, um, we uh, uh, within, within pharma uh, make increasing use of uh, artificial intelligence for machine learning um, to really look at smaller sets of data to try and utilize those to then form informed opinions on what we may expect in uh, clinical trials utilizing a drug in patients who have normal kidney function versus mildly impaired versus moderately impaired versus severely impaired. Uh, and putting all this information together um, can only help to accelerate to get to the point that through research collaborations uh, and then uh, ultimately brain diagnostics so that they are more broadly available at the point of care. Um, as uh, Jim Deere showed earlier uh, this morning, you can really begin to assess patients on a much more individualized basis. That's our goal, to be able to do this in as real time as possible, to give patients and their families as early a warning as is possible, but do it based upon real data. So the data coming from clinical pharma trials, and we can go to the next slide, they com can be coming from clinical pharma trials. They could be coming from academic publications where um, uh, assays have been developed. Uh, and then those, uh, those data regarding biomarkers can be then pooled with pharma uh, trials. And then other industry um, leaders. So uh, there are organizations that develop uh, in, uh, in vitro diagnostics. Uh, and companion diagnostics, not all companies do that. Not all companies have the same expertise, but having all that information flowing from the left side of the screen and then moving into the center, then you have the ability with data access by a diverse community. So this means not just pharma, not just governmental organizations, not just academia, but also patients uh, and patient advocacy groups. As information is accruing, if there's a, res uh, or a, a social responsibility, not if, there is a social responsibility to inform patients and their loved ones about the accruing data so that they can be aware of it and then they can bring that, uh, if necessary, to their own clinicians, uh, bring that awareness. So all of these pieces together, if we have this biomarker uh, repository developing and accruing data over time, having that data reinterrogated uh, to look at patients' baseline EGFR, to look at their specific kidney uh, disease condition. If we have patients from across the spectrum of humanity, we're going to be able to make more and more informed decisions. It's not going to happen overnight. But this process of sharing data is now becoming more routine. And others who speak later on, including now uh, Dr. Parikh from FDA uh, and then others tomorrow, you're going to find it very exciting. This is not something that's going to happen uh, five or 10 years from now. It's imminent. So, Amita, I'm going to stop talking and apologies if I ran over a bit. Thank you, Gary. So, yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amita Parekh from the FDA, where, where she has over 36 years' experience in um, different review divisions, working in the Office of the Commissioner, and now as a senior advisor for scientific collaborations in the Office of Translational Sciences, where she works as a, as a liaison to public private partnerships, um, and in particular, the Predictive Safety Testing Consortium. So, uh, Amita, I'll pass it to you right now. Thanks, Nick. Can you hear me, Nick? Yes, we can. Great. A great talk uh, now, Gary, and as well earlier. And uh, thank you also for taking us into this crystal ball and the, what the future state looks like. It's, it's really, in fact, very nicely setting the stage for my message. And I'm going to, you know, step away a little from the excellent, excellent, um, the unmet need that has been articulated already. And 
again, thanks for this opportunity to present. I also want to acknowledge all the stakeholders who had endless meetings and discussed unmet need many, many times from different perspectives. CPATH team, thank you so much for coordinating. And I also want to join everyone else in thanking Katrina, Wendy, Michelle, Nick, and I would like to add John Michael Sauer for his leadership and innovation and vision before he moved to his other role. So that, that was extremely important as well. Thanks, John, John Michael. I don't know if you're, uh, you are in the meeting or if you have joined. So I'm Amita Parikh from FDA, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And it's great to hear, as we, as we did from many of the speakers already, that the efforts that we as the agency put into tools development, such as biomarkers, are actually paying off. It was great to hear all those examples from many, many speakers uh, earlier today. We also heard from the other indus industry speakers that these safety biomarkers are in fact being used to make important go-no-go -no -go decisions and other risk assessment strategies are being based on these biomarkers. So the theme of this talk session is addressing the unmet needs. And I'll share examples of strategies that we have adopted towards this. And when I say we, I mean CEDAR. So I'll shed some light specifically on CEDAR's scientific collaboration activities through specifically public-private partnerships. Next slide, please. And the next. Thanks. So I'll cover in my talk the reason we are here, the issues at hand, and at a high level, what do we need and maybe how do we get there? Kind of getting into Gary's crystal ball, if we can. Next slide, please. So what brought us here? So we've heard loud and clear that drug-induced kidney injury is a public health issue. We need better tools, such as more sensitive biomarkers for early detection, so we can implement risk mitigation strategies during drug development, treatment, and patient management. And one of the recurring themes that we heard is the value of data sharing across researchers, definitely in a secure and anonymized way, because that was mentioned earlier as well. And all of this to enrich our knowledge base about drug-induced kidney injury. I have to use the cliche here, sorry about that, but rising tide raises all boats. And this perfectly applies to the scenario of data sharing regarding the users of novel kidney safety biomarkers and decision-making. Next slide, please. So in articulating the unmet need, let me start with some key messages that I heard from various speakers already. What did we hear from individuals impacted with kidney injury? We've heard some, we're gonna hear more. So what we've heard are personal perspectives regarding their kidney health issues. We heard that there is a need to get out of the silos and work collaboratively. We heard that if we do, the results will be more than just the sum of all parts. We heard that the patients want to be empowered with an understanding of the health issues so they can ask thoughtful questions when they talk to the health healthcare providers, for instance. We also heard that there is an appetite for novel biomarkers of kidney injury and for the best ways forward to use these for, uh, kidney safety and kidney health. We heard from the pharmaceutical industry that they are using novel kidney biomarkers in addition to standard biomarkers throughout their drug development phases. In the non-clinical phase, to select compounds for further development, go no go decisions. In early clinical testing to monitor for safety of new compounds in humans. And then in later phases of drug development to carefully assess the risk and benefit of compounds for further development. In addition, how drugs can be labeled. So I would take it that far. How, how can the drugs be labeled for helping with the most informed decisions for patients. 
With regards to the academic researchers in NIH, they are key to the foundational sciences and the deep understanding of the underlying basis of disease. They facilitate conversations at large venues about new discoveries. They play an important role in the understanding of prognostic and predictive nature of the biomarkers, for instance. Their role is key in the discovery of novel biomarkers and as well for communication with the broader scientific community. And the other stakeholders such as industry, for instance, can then validate these discoveries for further development and use. Not the least, we've heard from the FDA, we've heard from the FDA nephrologists that we are seeing many submissions during our regulatory processes where novel kidney biomarkers are being used for kidney injury detection. Decisions are being made within pharma companies based on these biomarkers. We know that biomarker data are collected across the AIDS spectrum at different stages uh, of injury as well. And most importantly, what we are hearing is that there are champions of data sharing in pharma companies who are willing and enthusiastic to share kidney safety, key kidney safety biomarkers data in a protected way, of course, to further the science of kidney safety. Next slide, please. So I mentioned data sharing. So how will this data sharing help and why should we? If this can be done, it'll help us to map out what kinds of data are out there, who else has the data, how can we pool this data, wherein lie the gaps, where are the challenges, what kinds of predictive tools do we need to develop, and then because these questions are not under the purview of a single organization to collectively address these uh, needs. And I think all of these really boils down to what Gary, you just mentioned, reinterrogating the data. So how do we do all this? Next, click please. So we can collaborate and partner and move the needle towards the understanding of drug-induced kidney injury and other related issues and develop predictive tools for use in drug development. Next slide, please. So the question is, is this a novel concept and does it work? No, this is not a novel con concept. And in fact, that's the reason Dr. Aliza Thompson, a nephrologist and a senior leader at the FDA initiated this dialogue amongst potential partners. So thanks Aliza for taking this forward. We at the FDA, we collaborate to catalyze innovations and this includes areas that have the potential for high impact on safety or efficacy or quality of regulated products. Developing predictive tools for drug-induced kidney injury is one such effort where the focus is kidney safety or F of FDA-approved products, regardless of their indication. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that this collaboration and partnership concept is not no novel at the FDA. So what I have here is our current state of collaboration for PPPs with CEDAR. So CEDAR is currently partnering with nearly 70 unique public-private partnerships with several national and international nonprofit groups. To, and they are addressing a diverse range of challenges in drug development including but not limited to safety, efficacy, and product quality. We've been collaborating with stakeholders such as industry, academia, patient groups, other government agencies, and foundational groups, etc., for over 15 years. You can see the timeline going from 2006 onwards, and the numbers keep growing, the numbers of PPP partnerships public-private partnerships keep growing. But there are some collaborations and discussions, as you can see, that started even before 2006. So these have been going on for a while. We've achieved many successes through such collaborative efforts. But I know it would be more compelling if I can share some examples for you. 
and I will. Next slide, please. So the question is, do these work? And maybe, you know, someone else mentioned, I think it was Stefan who said, what does success look like? So I've, what, what I've done is, next slide, please. So what I did was I picked a few examples across this trajectory. And there are many PPPs. Um, uh, I, I think Gary mentioned uh, two of them, Transpire Line, CEDARS, but there are many such PPPs. So what I did was I just picked three. A recent collaboration, ARC, the Amyloidosis Research Consortium, which is in the last couple of years, a not so recent one, the Transplant Therapeutic Consortium, which was a little earlier, and then a much more mature one, the Predictive Safety Testing Consortium, which is right up here in the 2006-2007 uh, timeframe. So next slide, please. So let me so let me start with the Transplant Therapeutic Consortium, TTC. And I would like to thank Amanda Klein from CPAT for sharing her slides. Thanks, Amanda. Next slide, please. So TTC is a collaboration with several stakeholders, many industry partners, NIH, Transplant Society, FDA. And one of their goals is to address long-term graft survival for kidney transplant. I'm gonna use that as an example. Next slide, please. So note that a defined deliverable always helps to keep the focus and your eye on the ball because there are so many issues. It's so important to tackle one little thing at a time so we can move forward rather than just get, it's like boiling the ocean. You don't want to be there. You want to define the focus define the deliverable, and then keep your eye on the ball and move in that direction. So theirs was, in this instance, graft failure kidney, for kidney transplant. So graft failure has significant negative outcomes. While therapies have significant, significantly improved short-term one-year outcomes, long-term survivals that remains really suboptimal. And it's a challenge for sponsors to design five to 10 year long primary outcome trials. So developing predictive tools would be very helpful here. So that was what they set out to do. Next slide, please. So this collaborative effort entails globally contributed data from transplant centers, several randomized clinical trial data sets, international collaboration of several industry partners and others. So the aggregated database now has standardized data from thousands of kidney transplant patients, uh, tr uh, transplant recipients, and this collaboration, what, so next, click please. Click, please. So, so this collaboration, what is it doing? So it has an aggregated database of thousands of patients. So this collaboration is developing a tool. It's called the iBox scoring system, which is a composite biomarker panel to be used at one year post-transplant for the prediction of five-year risk of allograft failure. I mean, just imagine, I, if this works, would this look like success? Click, please. Click, please. Sorry, my animated slides wanted to make it more dramatic. So another example, a much more recent one, the amyloidosis collaboration. And here I would like to acknowledge Rosalind Adigan of CEDAR for her insights in this issue. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, a very recent collaboration. Next slide, please. So amyloidosis is a group of rare diseases with amyloid protein deposits and tissues, a multi-systemic and phenotypically heterogeneous disorder. And you can see the similarities there with the kidney injury as well. There are various types, but AL with light chain proteins is the most common. 
So what's the unmet need here? It's a serious fatal rare disease with delayed diagnosis, needs safe treatments that would halt the disease or reverse damage or improve the patient's quality of life. And their main goal is to advance new therapies. And I've added a recent paper that came out of this group. And it's such a recent group, a new group, but they've already got this paper out that's discussing the development of a multi-domain endpoint given the heterogeneous nature of this disease. Exciting stuff, click please. Exciting stuff happening with this group. So they are at very early stages. Next slide. So they are at very early stages um, of addressing this need. They have established a partnership with FDA, academia, industry, and others. They've already developed the research roadmap and priority agenda, and some very uh, specific and noteworthy activity that we can all relate to. They've created a shared platform where data can be added, and this will help with disease characterization and, for example, development of a disease progression model. And that kind of a tool, you know, tools development could potentially improve clinical trial design. And they have Aspire, an industry collaborative of key companies engaged in this space to discuss the challenges and share resources pre-competitively to advance this initiative. And again, I'm bringing this up again. We see a lot of commonalities here with that of what we are discussing today regarding the kidney injury. Next slide, please. Another example, a more seasoned and mature partnership, the Predictive Safety Testing Consortium. Next slide, please. So the primary goal is development and qualification of novel translational safety biomarkers for drug development. Note again, and many speakers have mentioned earlier already, that biomarker qualification is an option. It's not a prerequisite for their use in drug development. So PSTC has several stakeholders as partners. They started in 2006, click please. And in 2008, they received a regulatory qualification for seven novel kidney safety biomarkers for non-clinical use. Click please. In 2018, a composite of six novel kidney tubular injury biomarkers were qualified. And this was for clinical use in phase one setting. This is awesome. This all sounds great. I know it took a long time and this was mentioned by several speakers ahead. The question is, are these being used? Is all of this effort useful? And does it help drug development? Next, click please. So we've already heard from several speakers and industry partners that yes, these are being used for making early drug development decisions. We also know from regulatory applications, INDs and NDAs, and other sources such as clintrials.gov as well as PubMed, that these are being used in decision-making. A survey of regulatory submissions for the use of a couple of novel kidney safety biomarkers KIM-1 and Clustrin revealed a very interesting trajectory of use over the years. And I want to acknowledge Ru Chen and Shashi Amur of CEDAR for this survey. So these bar graphs, the top two, are for overall regulatory application. So just note that on the left side here is KIM-1, on the right side here is Clustrin. But if you look across, look across the blue, and look across the multicolored ones, you see a very interesting uh, trend. So these bar graphs, the top two are for the overall regulatory application and the bottom two with colored bars are broken down by use in clinical and non-clinical studies. The time scale here goes from 2005 to 2016 
and see how their use is going up after they were qualified. Not just in non-clinical, because remember back in 2008, it was just non-clinical uh, context of use qualification, but their use is going up in both non-clinical as well as clinical use. So the green bars here are clinical uses of these biomarkers that were qualified for non-clinical use. Very interesting. So they weren't waiting for non-clinical qualification. They took what was out there and started implementing it in, in not just non-clinical, but also clinical studies. So one can conclude that the novel kidney safety biomarkers are being used during drug development for making decisions and the collaborative efforts are paying off. They're paying dividend. And if researchers could share what they are being used for, because they've started using them way before they were qualified for clinical use. So if researchers could share what these are being used for, we could potentially broaden their context of use. Next slide, please. So what did it take for us to get here? What did it take for PSTC and CPATH to get here with these qualifications. Next slide, please. Next slide, thanks. So researchers coming together, sharing data, resources, sharing samples, conducting additional studies together. And all of this was being done in pre-competitive space. And all of this matters because it enables companies to develop drugs more efficiently and to deliver safe therapies to patients. Next slide, next click. It, so it can't be done single-handedly, it takes a village. So the question is, where do we go from here? So are, are we done? Are we home yet? Are we there yet? So going back, what brought us here? Next slide, please. So we have access to an unprecedented knowledge and understanding of kidney safety biomarkers, their use and their value. We know that these novel biomarkers are useful in decision-making. We know that there's knowledge and experience for their use preclinically and clinically. We know that these novel biomarkers have allowed drug development programs to advance to clinic while ensuring patient safety successfully. So the question is, why not share it in a secure, standardized way? Pool data will potentially support broader applications and uses. And at the end of the day, it'll create a win-win for all of us. Next slide, please. And what one such program and a platform, and several speakers have uh, mentioned this already, uh, th this is a platform for data sharing. It's CPATS biomarker data repository, they call it BMDR. We need to just get used to this uh, acronym BMDR. So it started, I think it was around 2013, but a pilot effort within this BMDR effort started in 2017, 2018. And it was designed to share experiences with novel biomarkers to expand the knowledge base aimed at new and modified contexts of use for kidney safety biomarkers. And Elisa alluded to this. This was built by CPATH Institute through PSTC. The pilot was supported by FDA though. And this, the, the support from the FDA and the endorsement from the FDA, next slide please, is in this letter. It was from Dr. Woodcock several years back, I think maybe three, four, five years back. Uh, but it, it was basically, it's on their website, but um, this is basically through this letter of support that this pilot concept was supported and hopefully it'll move forward from here on. Next slide, please. So with that aspiration, hopefully the BMDR will get more enriched. Gary and many others have promised that it will. Um, I thank you for listening and we have our fingers crossed and we are staring at your crystal ball, Gary. Thank you. I just wanted to ask for the entire public uh, if they are open to questions for Amita. Uh, for me personally, it's like, um, 
you have uh, explained a lot of uh, possibilities, but industry is not willing to share data. How do you want to ad adapt it? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So, so I think this is what I would do, Frank. I, yeah. Yes, many are not willing to uh, share the data, but I would look at this glass half full. I wouldn't look at it as half empty. So we will already heard from many speakers today. I know we're gonna hear from speakers later today or well, tomorrow that they are willing to share the data. So let's focus on that. E exactly, I'm on the opposite side, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, also, uh, how do you ensure if pharma sh shares the data that they are not uh, hold responsible for the data? That's so, a big so issue for pharma. Uh, let, let's say um, a, a company like Roche shares many data and they don't want to be responsible or made responsible for the data results. It's, I, I can, I, I know that crystal ball, okay? Yeah. What I would say, at least for this one part, Frank, is yeah. let's start. I know more will join. I know that, and the reason is we have seen that. Yeah. And this is for very huge unmet needs, yeah. And I can give an example of Critical Path Institute, the Alzheimer's disease. Who yeah. was willing to share data at one point? Exactly. No one. No one. Exactly. And, and if you go back and look yeah. at the number of companies that are coming in and sharing data. So and you're, you're confident that yes. once you get a number of companies that the other companies will join as yeah. well. So yes, yes. Yeah, so fr Frank and Namita, I, I, I think this is a, a, an important topic, um, but in the interest of time, we do need to move to the breakout. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting, but <laughs> it's something I wanted to help from Amita directly. <laughs> All right, thanks. I, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope you're able to join us again tomorrow. We have some excellent um, additional presentations and a panel session, as well as one more breakout session tomorrow. So I look forward to engaging with, with all of you again on this topic and, and moving towards a, a framework um, around what we've discussed today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>